Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, based on where you're at on the globe today. Welcome to a special, we've got a good, you know, good show today. It's going to be a comic artist spotlight on Mike Fosberg, and we're going to be talking with him a little bit. We're going to be showing some artwork for sale after that, and I hope everybody in, you know, is here to enjoy the conversation, ask questions. I hope you brought, brought some uh, thoughts that you wanted to you know, convey to Mike, and uh, we're going to be joined by both uh, Mike and Chuck right now. Let me bring them into, this, into the uh, studio here. Welcome, Mike, and welcome, Chuck. How are you guys Hello, yeah. doing today? Hello, everyone. Lovely here in Southern California once again. See, lucky you. It's morning there, afternoon here. And Mike, you're in California as well, right? I think you and Chuck are... Uh, you should be able to tell by that brilliant sunshine behind me. <laughs> yeah. Mike got me to come out here. I used to come visit him uh, back when I used to live in D.C. And so I had so many trips out there. I was like, yeah, why not just move? That way I'll be a little bit closer. <laughs> yeah. Well... I don't think I'll be moving out to the West Coast, but I do hope to move someplace south in the next few years. I'm I'm still in Northeast Ohio, and tired of the winter. So, but uh, Mike, I, I I was reading your bio on the site. You're you're from Michigan originally. Yeah, okay, Northeast Ohio. You were you know, um, yeah. I grew up in in uh, um, um, uh, what Southeast Michigan in, okay. in Detroit. I grew up in Pontiac. Yeah, sure. So, uh, yeah, um, it was a uh, that was that was a big trip. You go down to Toledo, you know. It was uh, that was a big city. Yeah. So, uh, well, actually, we were in the big city already. That was just you know where you went south. So, uh, uh, but uh, no, that was the other thing too. Is is uh, I never quite adapted to Michigan weather. Uh, and uh, living out here, I'm I'm quite happy with the sunshine and uh, you know, whatever else. Palm trees, not not the fire so much, Mike. I know you're not a big fan of of, of that part of the season, but uh, outside of that, it's it's very nice most of the year. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. We don't have to worry about about that over here. But so so so, Mike, uh, you know, growing up in the Midwest, how did you get into comics originally, and and what what uh, made you want to become a, a comics illustrator? Um, I like, you know, I, I liked, um, I, I had met a friend in school that, uh, he was doing his own little homemade comics, uh, my friend Fred Jackson. And, um, um, we immediately, I thought, Hey, that's cool. So we started doing our own little comics and trading them back and forth. And right about that time, uh, Jerry Bales, uh, uh, instituted comic fandom. Or I, I don't know if the right institute is the right word, but anyway, he, he got us all public. So he brought a lot of fans together so we could all start to share what we were doing. And uh, Jerry did one of the first fanzines. And um, that was, was, was for me, it was like, oh, that's the next step. I want to do one of those. So I was extremely fortunate that I, I was in an area here where I had Jerry maybe 15, 20 miles away. I could actually go visit him and see what he was doing. Um, and there were any number of folks uh, of, of you know of like interest around. So I mean, in in um, Detroit was a real hotbed of comic fans. I mean, we had you know like like uh, younger guys that came out were like you know Starlin, Milgram, Rich Buckler, Terry Austin, um, you know, Arvel Jones, oh, well, yeah. Mike, Mike Nazar. I mean, you know, just Keith Pollard. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, Tom Orzakowski, I mean, the less just keeps going on. And so you know, at the time I was 15, 16 years old, through my correspondence with, with comic fans and with the younger guys that I was meeting, I probably met everybody I was going to work with in the industry until I was, you know, in, uh, in my late 20s. So, I mean, it was great when I went into Marvel for the first time. Um, or, you know, or, and brought my stuff around to show. Nobody was that going to be that impressed with it, but at least they knew who I was. I mean, because they knew me from the fanzines. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and, and, and oddly enough, I got into it kind of late because I, I started, you know, I started in the fanzines when I was in high school when I was a you know, freshman or sophomore and then completely dropped out of comics uh, because it just, it seemed like a fantasy life to me. I mean, it's like, yeah, this is fun, but nobody can actually do that for a living. Um, so, I mean, I was, you know, in college, got my degree, 
taught school. And so it was in my early 20s before I actually started to uh, to look around for work. Um, I mean, one of my friends was Jim Starlin, and uh, you know we would always get together as kids, um, teenagers, and and you know we'd be we'd be doing things. And when I saw Jim getting work, um, you know it made it real. It was like, oh, you can actually do this. <laughs> um, and and plus. You know, you're young, you have this youthful arrogance that like, oh, this shouldn't be too hard. Um, you know, if, if if you really understood what the process was and, and what was required of you, um, I probably would have stayed as a teacher. But uh, uh, but that was even harder. So uh, um, it was easy to move into comics, you know. Mm -hmm. So what time period is this? Is this uh, early 70s? Yeah, I, yeah. I, I did the, the fanzines in uh, the, the mid-60s, early 60s. And uh, on the old mini, mimeograph machines, right, Mike? Yeah, my dad was a janitor at, um, at, at a school, so I had access to, you know, the what they called the spirit duplicator. Well, the, remember the things you used to get in school with the purple link on it? Oh, yeah. Um, and so that's what your fanzines, that's what we're, we were done on, and... Um, um, I mean, that was the whole process. And, um, but I mean, it was, it was like, as an editor, the first thing I did was fire myself as an artist. Cause I mean, I looked at the art and went, oh, this is, this is pretty bad compared to the guys I'm getting. You're going to have to get better before I'm going to let you back into my fanzine. So, uh, but it was, it was great because you learned about reproduction in terms of this is what I'm drawing. This is what it's going to look like in print. Um, but uh, so when I eventually moved, you know, like I like said, in the late uh, in the early uh, 70s, once I left teaching and I started to look for work, the industry was booming. So, you know, jobs were readily available. Um, I'd had a lot of experience just from working in fanzines. And I had been working around these guys that were professionals now uh, for a number of years. I mean, I got to see, you know, what, what, what original artwork looked like. And, um, I mean, you know, guys like, like Buckler and, uh, 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 you know, uh, Simonson and Milgram, you could, you know, you could talk to them about the job, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to just coming into it cold from, you know, uh, without having any contact with everyone. So that was, that was a big help. Um, because my degree was in, in English literature and education. I didn't have any art training. Um, I know you're going to find it hard to believe when you look at the early work. But <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the, the English well, literature background probably helped you as an editor, though, of, those, of your fanzines. Well, that was the other thing, too. I discovered, like, I don't want to be an editor either. You know, like, <laughs> um, I, I like drawing. Actually, what really helped me was that I had a degree in, in English literature and I found in comics and even later on when I got into, uh, you know, animation and movies, story is the essential thing. Uh, what art scales you have will be helpful in projecting that, but unless you're focused on the story, unless you can tell a story, um, it doesn't matter how well you draw. I mean, I look at, at guys like I look at Frazetta and I look at, uh, who's, who's he like, Boris. Boris is a far better painter, probably. But in terms of being able to just to tell a visceral story, you can't beat Frazetta. Mm -hmm. You know, so, I mean, it's it's like that's the essential thing in terms of, of getting this across. And in advertising, it's you're, cre you're, you're communicating with your audience. And so uh, the better you can um, and, and the simpler you can create an image and show it to your to your audience to get a point across or to tell a story, uh, the more successful you're going to be at this stuff. So, so what was some of your first professional comics work? Um, actually, I started working out for or working with. Um, uh, I did mystery stories for Gold Key Comics. Uh, I think I was with Boris Karloff and Twilight Zone, sure. and then I did um, um, a couple things for Marvel. Uh, they were doing kind of the mystery anthologies too. Um, same thing with George Orlando at DC. I was, you know, was doing a couple, uh, you know, stories that way. And um, uh, what was the other place? Charlton Comics. Uh, I think, you know, I, and so, I mean, that was really kind of what I broke into. And then 
uh, within a, a year or two, I, I mean, it, it became the focus in the industry was superheroes. So I wound up doing, I think the first um, adventure stuff I did was probably uh, Shang-Chi, uh, the, um, you know, the karate books, which mm -hmm. for me, I was just so excited because I was doing the, the, the son of Fu Manchu, which was, you know, my favorite uh, um, uh, mystery kind of series when I was a kid. Um, in fact, that was the first printed work that I had. I think when I was about 20, 21 years old, someone did an autobiography. Uh, an, an autumn or a, a biography of um, uh, Sax Romer, the creator of, uh, of Fu Manchu, and I wound up doing the the, the drawings on the dust uh, jacket covers. Wow, cool! And, uh, and I don't think I ever do it. Did a, a book cover again? <laughs> you know, so, um, but uh, from there, I mean, you know, so like once I got my foot in the door. Uh, like I said, it was it was a, a very prosperous time in the industry, and people were bidding. You know, if, if you started working for Marvel, you automatically got calls from DC. You know, it's like well, maybe you'd like to do some work for us, um, and vice versa. If you started working for DC, Marvel mm -hmm. was interested in you. Um, and then they started to get you. You know, they wanted to get you into a contract where you only work for us exclusively. So um, it was a good time that way. So you'd have to have like a, a pseudonym if you wanted to work for both companies if you got under contract. Well, no, you could work. You could work wherever you wanted, but yeah. in terms of like I said, if 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 like if you were a very successful artist for Marvel, it was like uh, you know they wanted to induce you, so they would offer you a contract. Uh, and you know, as the young kids were going contracts, this is really cool. I've got a contract. Well, basically, what the contract said was, uh, if we have work, we'll give it to you. If we don't have work, you're out of luck. You know, but it was. Uh, uh, I mean, it was, um, I think one of the first things you wanted to learn as a young artist and most of the guys that didn't is that these guys aren't your family. They're just someone you're working for. They're not there to make sure that you're well taken care of. And, and, uh, you know, they're not there for your benefit. You're there for their benefit. Mm -hmm. Um, so it was, you know, it, it's, um, uh, you know that that's kind of a learning experience that way. But but Mar those Marvel days, you were getting sort of assignments to do like Marvel team ups, and, and ultimately you got to be the regular on the She Hulk, right? Um, yeah, I think uh, I I've been working for several years. I did two or three series for uh, for Marvel. I did one called uh, The Mighty Isis, which was a TV show, and then I did another barbarian uh, woman called Starfire, which was uh, you know fairly popular at the time. Those are DC. Uh, those were DC, Mike. Yeah, right. Those are, like I said, those. Yeah. That's what I was doing yeah. for DC. Consequently, yeah. then I get a call from Marvel going, "How would you like to do, you know, uh, whatever?" So I mean, then then I started doing. I think it was um, uh, Miss Marvel uh, mm -hmm. at DC, and uh, um, you know, fill in stuff. Um, and I, I was really hopscotching back and forth between the companies. Then I mean, I I. I don't have a timeline in front of me to go, I guess, and this year I did this and this year I did that. But um, I can remember I went back to, to DC and worked on um, some other uh, uh, projects, but I think it was, what was it, Super Villains? Uh, Super Villain like. team up, yeah. yeah. And, and then uh, returned to Marvel to do uh, uh, She Hulk. I mean, I think that was kind of the, the first. Um, series that I did uh, and that was I was followed by GI Joe or GI Joe come before that I'm not that was after you you took over GI Joe I think in 83 right after Herb Trumpy left okay okay but yeah you were doing She-Hulk was like late 70s early 80s and then and right then moved on to, and then you did a little uh, Team America as well if I remember correctly okay I was gonna say I can't remember <laughs> um, I had done She-Hulk for a couple of years. I think it was probably the longest running, you know, that that um, series that I was involved in. And then GI Joe was next. I did that for maybe a year and a half. Um, but it was interesting because GI Joe was was more like we got this guy. Where are we going to stick him? Uh, because GI Joe was not a um, not a comic fan book. Um, 
which was really fascinating because um, in those days, you know, we got royalties and the royalty on GI Joe was fantastic. They were selling half a million, you know, close to three, 400,000 copies uh, an issue, which at the time was, was fantastic, but they weren't selling them to comic fans. They were selling them to kids who, who liked the toys. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, I'm, Marvel must have just been scratching their head over like, well, what's this all about? Um, and he couldn't do crossovers. I mean, you couldn't very well do the X-Men visit G.I. Joe. Um, so I think the art had kind of a different look to it than um, um, uh, you were. Uh, it, it probably, you know, was less of that kind of, you know, uh, Marvel Kirby look. And it was, it was more... Um, almost action adventure, I guess. Um, and my work was always a little quieter in comics. So it kind of fit what they were doing. And um, it was realistic for the most part. So um, I kind of fit with the series that way in terms of what they were doing. Um, and, um, um, you know, I, oddly enough, I had a very hard time relating to the, the, the whole concept and characters uh, weren't something that I would normally be, be looking at or doing anything with um, because I had just come out of the Vietnam War era. And so the idea of doing a, a military book uh, was a little you know, off-putting. But it was quickly pointed out to me like, well, this isn't a military book, this is a spy book. Um, and I was fortunate I had, um, as editor and writer on the series, was Larry Hama, and his stories were incredible. They were um, the best guys I worked with in comics that, that were writers were also artists because they understood visually what you're trying to do. Uh, I mean, so you'd get a script and they would really break it down in terms of this is what you're looking at rather than a lot of talking and a lot of, you know, uh, exposition. Um, so Larry's stories were always, you know, they were fun or exciting. Um, that was a real plus on the series. And Larry even did the uh, cover layouts for all the, all the, uh, issues, Larry right? and uh, I think Ed Hannigan did a bunch of them too. I mean, Ed did so many of the Marvel, um, uh, covers over the years that, uh, uh, it's hard for me to separate which ones did which, but I know Larry did some cause I just found some in my, uh, uh, I found a couple in my, uh, uh, uh file someplace and, and sent them back to him about a year or so ago, you know, so, uh, um, but, uh, yeah, they, like I said, that stuff was, was, um, um, uh, it was a certain amount of fun working on it. The hard part was that every issue, there were 20 characters and they were all, you know, supposed to be identifiable. And, um, um, that, um, was a little difficult. I mean, uh, uh Larry gave me a great idea and said, he said, well, just cast people for him. So if we're doing, uh, you know, like Duke, I'm going to do Burt Lancaster. And if we're going to do uh, another character, I'm going to bring in, uh, you know, I'm going to draw him so he looks like, uh, you know, Harrison Ford or, you know, whoever. So, I mean, when I drew the characters, I had a specific person or model or someone in, you know, in mind uh, for what I wanted it to look like. Uh, more, you know, I'm the only one I can only remember is uh, who's a Dr. Venom immediately went, Oh, it's gotta be Peter Cushing. So, uh, um, that was kind of like the way that I, that I worked on the characters. So you, when you took over from, uh, Trimpy, there weren't already, I assume you must've had some kind of character designs and style guides that you had to follow, but you still put kind of your own spin on, on what you, the way you viewed the characters. Yeah, there wasn't a lot. I can't remember getting many. I mean, like you'd get a, you know, you'd get an issue of a comic with a panel circled and go, you know, this is Tripwire or, you know, whatever. Or and I'm not even sure if he was one of the original ones, but uh, um, I mean, <laughs> I was the most popular uncle in Michigan at the time because every toy, every new, um, you know, um, um, what do they call those things? I don't say dolls, but uh, vehicles. Oh, no. Um, character, every new character, every new vehicle. I got shipped to my house. So, I mean, it was always great to go see Uncle Mike and you could have this whole, you know, clue of G.I. <laughs> Joe toys you could you could play with. Um, and that's what you had for reference. 
Um, and so for the characters themselves, the costumes was, you know, they were extremely important. You know, did you get all the light, you know, the, the, you know, the microphone off them and the, the way their helmets were and if they had, you know, um, camouflage, what they looked like, nobody cared about. So, I mean, I got to, you know, like I say, I could draw them the way that I saw them. Mm-hmm. And if there anybody who came after me, they could, you know, as long as they got dark hair and, and uh, you know, a pointed nose or whatever, they could just run with that. Uh, but for me, it just made the, the artwork easier to do if I was actually looking at a, at a likeness to, uh, uh, to kind of work with some of these characters. Most of which probably disappeared by the time I saw in print, but, you know, it was, um, was what I could work with in terms of differentiating these characters. Well, that's interesting. And you're right, their costumes were far more important than what they looked like at the end. As far as the, the people who were fans of G.I. Joe, they just wanted to make sure you had the you know the right beret with the right style and uh, whether or not the, you know, the right weapon. Right, which is very important from a storytelling point of view. I mean, I, I so often will see movies where the, the director has cast two young guys in their 20s, both with blonde hair. And they'll show up in different scenes and you're always like, uh, okay, which one is which? And, um, you know, being best friends with them, he's going, you can't tell them apart, you know, but for the audience it's like, no, we can't. Um, so, I mean, it's one of those things you kind of look for in terms of even doing stories. I mean, realistically, you're going to change your clothes every so often, but when you're doing, you know, a comic book character, you want to keep them in pretty much the same kind of outfit. So they're immediately recognizable. Um, and I mean, and with superheroes, that's great because they've got a costume. Uh, but if you're doing, you know, even even a character like G.I. Joe, they've got a costume too. But it's it's something you have to to continually be aware of as you're drawing them. It's like, um, how is it, how is how is your viewer, your reader, going to know immediately that this is this character? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, once once that costume is gone, excuse me, once that costume is gone. Yeah, Mike, I can tell you, I, I still can't tell the difference sometimes between Duke and Hawk because they both have this blonde, uh, you know, sort of short haircut. <laughs> We've got a buzz cut. Uh, yeah, yeah, they, all, they both look somewhat the same to me, but, you know. <laughs> um, so it's a... Uh, um, but then, so so after you after you left Marvel, you went on to Valiant, I think, for a little bit? Um, Actually, I left Marvel to come to California. I mean... Uh, one of the uh, realities of working for Marvel was that uh, um, I managed to get on uh, Jim Shooter's blacklist, and so trying to get work, it was it was like you know you you discover from editors that I can't really hire you now, you know, um, and so I was doing the um, and I wasn't alone. I mean, there was there was a ton of guys like that. I mean, you know, I'm sure Chaikin was there and and uh, uh, and a lot of us were doing things for the um, creator own books. Like I did, they did Epic and Heavy Hitters at the time. And I did series for both of those. Um, I did Sisterhood of Steel for, um, for one and, and Offcast for the other. Um, but uh, about that same time, um, I, I got remarried and I moved to, uh, to California. And I was working on Sisterhood of Steel, which was written by a woman named uh, Christy Marks. Well, Christy Marks was also the um, most prominent writer for uh, um, Hasbro Animation. So she was doing all the, uh, the uh, I think she created the gem characters. She was doing a lot of the, the G.I. Joe features. Um, I'm sure what, what else was there. I don't know if she did Transformers or whatever. But, I mean, so when I moved out here and I was kind of looking for some freelance stuff, she was like, Hey, you know, you should go talk to, to Marvel. And, you know, and I think she was really my in uh, for working on the GI Joe animated series. Cause a, I had done the comic for a number of years. Um, and B, like I said, I had someone who could introduce me to people at the studio. Well, the other thing is you walk into the studio and everyone, I mean, you'd have guys come up and go, Hey Mike, you know, I know your stuff from comics. You know, it's, it's, you weren't walking in cold. Um, on the other hand, the directors and and you know uh, uh, were were like, oh my god, another comic book guys. These guys really have problems with this stuff. Um, 
fortunately for me, my biggest influence was not comics growing up, but it was movies. So, I mean, I understood the whole um, continuity process in movies uh, uh, probably better than I understood the, uh, you know, the comic book process. Uh, I mean, comic books, you're basically doing a poster and on that poster, you're going to have a certain number of pictures that uh, tell a story, but they also have to face kind of like one big, you know, um, one big image that you're looking at. Uh, Kubert explained this to me very, very succinctly one time. Um, and uh, when you get into animation, you're working on a film. Everything is the same size all the time. And you're moving from, you know, from one to another. Um, so I got that process, I think, you know, and, and um, I was trying to get work as a storyboard artist and everyone was very, we haven't done it before. You know, we really, you know, it, it, this is a really complicated process. Um, but fortunately, Marvel was going through the same growing pains out here that the comic books had in terms of like, we need to get more guys working on this stuff. So uh, they said at first they said, well, come in and we'll, we'll use you as a, as a, you know, an assistant or whatever, and you can work with someone, see how they do it. And then it was like, well, we really, everyone is so busy doing that stuff. They don't have time to show an assistant, anything. Uh, maybe we'll, we'll give you, um, you know, a script and you come in and we can work with someone while you do it. And then it was like, oh, we don't even have time for that. Here's a script, take it home, do it, bring it back and we'll fix it. And, and you know, and, and, and see what we can tell you. Well, I did the script for a GI Joe or, you know, I did the, you know, the thing brought it back and it was like, Oh great. You're hired. And I mean, it was, it was, it was that quick. It was, it was like, you know, within, within a week, uh, I was offered a job at Marvel productions. And the best part was it was just like comics because the other places that I've been going around to looking for storyboard work with, you know, like, sorry, you come out of comics. You don't understand how to do this stuff. Um, they were getting a call. I was getting a call from them in another week or two. Once they saw my name on, on the union role as a storyboard artist, it was like that automatically gave me credence in terms of, Oh, let's know how to do the job. I, I think one of the funniest things was I had uh, my friend, uh, Warren Greenwood, um, had also done comics and I was asking him about getting into, you know, doing animation and storyboards. He goes, Oh, you want to do storyboards? Said, well, I can probably teach you how to do that in about 15 minutes. And I mean, you know, because he understood that, you know, it's like if you understand storytelling, there's a few little things you need to know for for um, for movies and th in terms of, of like, you know, uh, you know, not crossing the axis of the camera, you know, just technical things. And, you know, you don't want to do jump cuts. You don't want to jump from, a, you know, a big close up of a head to three guys talking, you know, like, a, you know, just things like that that I'm going like, as a storyteller, I didn't do that anyway. Um, so, I mean, um, one of my favorite cartoonists over the years was, uh, was Bill Watterson, who did um, uh, the, the Calvin and Hobbes stories. Mm -hmm. And I, I love that strip. But he also drive me nuts because he would do the first two or three panels in, a, you know, in the daily strip with the characters facing in one direction. And then in the last one, he completely flip them, and as a movie guy, it was like, no, no, you can't do that, you know. <laughs> and I mean, it worked well. I mean, comic readers understood it perfectly. For a movie audience, it would be, you know, they 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 change dramatically. So, um, let's well, let's good that you made the transition so easily. That's yeah, that that's uh, that's uh, that was a good thing moving out to the West Coast and just falling into that right um, away. The, the other big difference for me was working in comics. I used to get this in terms of, of, well, you know, nobody knows who you are. You're not a very big star. And I mean, in comics, if you had two or 300,000 people who are aware of your work, that was your audience. Once I started working in animation and film, it moved into two or 300 million people. Um, I mean, I'm, I, one of my other friends I was talking to was said, like, people might not know my name, but, you know, by the time, um, you know, uh, I had kind of finished my career, 
it was very difficult to talk to someone who hadn't seen something that I did on TV or, you know, whatever. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's like you, 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 you know, it, and it was the other thing It was, it was interesting meeting people from, uh, movies and, and animation, even advertising is like, whew, these guys were, you know, were, were incredible artists and kind of giants in their industry. And I would, I would look at the work. I would, I would say, Oh, I've seen that. But I wouldn't know the name. And it was, it was like, you know, but, but you certainly understood, um, you know, what, what you were looking at. Mm-hmm. So it was, I, I, one of the interesting things was I'd worked on the Tales from the Crypt uh, series. For HBO? I wound up doing all the comic book covers for them. There are 93 of those, yeah. <laughs> 93 episodes. That was quite a run. For some reason, I always thought there was 100, but I guess 90, you know. I, you know well, there was movies as well, so I didn't count that as a um, number. But. But, but one of the things that struck me was, you know, I, I got to sign all those. And I was thinking, like, man, I can't think of another cartoonist that got to put their signed work, you know, in front of the camera. Um, I mean, that was, uh, again, that was just serendipity in terms of, uh, <clears throat> you know, having a job, uh, something to do. Um, and Mike, my, my, yeah, as a storyboard artist, you worked on some other great things. Like, I didn't know Eminem's uh, stand video. I think that, you know, again, that was what probably one of the most impressive videos that I had seen at the time. And you, you know, I, I know later on that you laid that out. And uh, and then you got to work on the Chronicles of Narnia series. Uh, all three of those movies, I mean, pretty, pretty fantastic. And uh, and then Spawn, where you, you won an Emmy. Right. So yeah, you did some pretty impressive work as a storyboard artist. Yeah. Well, you know, me, you're speaking of Eminem. That was another cultural lesson for me because I knew of of Eminem only as like, oh, this rap artist, and like, oh my God, you know, it's like, well, I'll draw the storyboard, but just don't make me listen to the music. Well, I did, but when I listened to the story, I was like, oh my God, this guy is one of the most astute storytellers I've ever seen. I mean, it was it was like it was a joy doing the you know the storyboard for it because it was like, you know, it was it wasn't disjointed images just coming in and flashing out. It was like, it was a really a really poignant, dramatic story that he was telling. Um, and I always used to amuse me that I was doing you know I did Eminem and I did Fifty Cent and uh, you know it was a, I think there was Gwen Stefani and Marilyn Manson. I'm thinking like, okay, here's this little bald white guy doing all the storyboards for all these, uh, uh, you know, the rap videos. Um, I'm, I'm sure I've told Chuck this story, but um, when I was working on those one day, uh, the director said, hey, we've got to go visit Dr. Dre today. And I'm like, well, I've heard of this. Oh, man, you know, I don't know if I, you know, uh, you know, this, uh, this gangster rap and all this stuff. So we wound up at his house and what struck me was that, that it was like, you know, it was this kind of, you know, like gated community or whatever. And while we're there, his teenage son comes up and goes, you know, um, hey, Dad, I want to run down to the park for an hour or two and, and shoot baskets. Is that okay? And he goes, all right, you back. Just be back in time for dinner. And I was kind of laughing. I'm going, wait, wait, Dr. Dre is Bill Cosby. You know, <laughs> it was, um, you know, it was, it was an interesting uh, afternoon. But I got back that night and my wife worked at the zoo at the time. Um, and fundraising thing, I said, hey, you won't believe where I spent the day today. I said, I went to Dr. Dre's house. And she looks at me and goes, yeah, well, I had to have you Hefner and his six girlfriends to tour the zoo today. So it was like, ah, you know. She so uh, went up to you. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I guess working as an artist, one of the things you discovered early was um, – get lots of different clients from different areas in the industry and you hopscotch back and forth between, uh, between them. I, I always, you know, laughingly tell people I managed to personally kill three or four industries all by my own. You know, I watched animation, you know, go from like, you know, just, uh, uh, just every all time high, yeah. to, you know, think, you know, there was no work available. Mm-hmm. Um, the same way in comics, uh, I, you know, it's like in between I got into advertising, not because I wanted to get into advertising, but because that was the only work available at the time. Um, So, and the good news on all those was that 
in each different kind of field you got into, you learn something different about the storytelling process and the graphic image process. Um, and so when I would come back into comics, I would bring that aesthetic with me. Um, so, I mean, I think one of, the, one of the sad things that happened to the comic book industry is that we got blinders on and um, basically Marvel came up with the idea of, 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 you know, let's take Jack Kirby and just do Jack Kirby comics um, and um, lost, you know, the whole new audience that were coming in in terms of, you know, what other um, uh, approaches can we t uh, take with this? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think of all the friends that I had that were very successful in comics, went out and did their own features. I mean, you know, like Frank Miller and Mike Mignola. Um, if you wanted to really be a successful cartoonist, you didn't stay at Marvel or DC because you were just going to wind up doing the company project. And again, uh, that was not your project. That was theirs. So. Oh, so that Mike, you, you, I was just going to probably say the same thing you were, Chuck. So is that what kind of got you into doing your own self-published work? Well, that and there wasn't anything available in comics that I really wanted to do. I mean, mm -hmm. superheroes were, they weren't anything I was great at. I mean, I, I could do them, but I didn't have any real, you know, after I got to be, after I stopped being a teenager, um, they stopped, they, there wasn't an appeal there. So, I mean, um, I started doing my creator own comics. Um, the first one I did was Lori Lovecraft and Lori Lovecraft was based on my experiences on Tales from the Crypt. Every week we'd have this beautiful new young starlet who was coming in, who was the hottest thing in Hollywood that week. Six months later, nobody was going to know her name, you know, and, and Lori is like, you know, 23, 24 and she's already an you know, over the hill hag, you know, she's too old to work. So she decides to, um, you know, um, become a sorceress. And she's not really any better at that. But um, for me, it gave me a chance to kind of make my own little, you know, movies um, and do a pastiche of my favorite films with like, you know, Boris Karloff and William Powell and uh, uh, God, Alfred Hitchcock. Um, so all my all my Lori stories were, were basically, you know, based on... Um, uh, or inspired by my favorite films. And I had the real advantage of, um, um, of my friend, uh, Pete Ventrella, um, who had created his own series and, um, working with Dan Aykroyd, uh, was writing the stuff and, uh, he really took it forward, you know, with his, with his writing and his dialogue and took it to another level. Um, and, I think probably since I've retired, I've, I've, I've continued to do comics just because I love the graphic story medium. I have absolutely no interest, not in the comic industry, but I love doing the graphic stories. So, I mean, since then I've, I've, you know, like I said, I've done my, you know, my mad mummy series and kind of voodoo mansion, which was an offshoot of Lori and, um, retro wood, which is, like I said, another, uh, full Hollywood in the thirties. Um, and it gave me a chance to, like I said, to do the kind of stories that I really enjoyed. Um, I don't know what kind of, uh, I think there's a poet Wordsworth who, who used to say, I have a fit audience, but few. And I think that kind of describes my, uh, you know, my comic book projects is, um, I have people that have followed them, but I mean, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to compete with the X-Men that way, you know? So, so uh, if anybody wanted to pick up any of the, the back issues, I mean, what's the best place for them to find your earlier work or anything that you've been working on in the last couple of years? Um, you don't buy print issues anymore. You get digital issues. Yeah. That was another thing I had to learn was that um, um, You know, as mentioned, Calvin and Hobbes. I think if, if Bill Watterson came along with Calvin and Hobbes today, he'd starve to death because there are no newspapers anymore for the most part, or that can afford to carry comic script. Uh, print medium is is fast disappearing. What is there is digital medium. So all of my comics are available digitally. 
Um, I think the easiest way to find them is, is simply to Google something. I've I've done two blogs for these for the past decade. One is called Vaz Word, and it's basically you know my adventures in the industry and also um, uh, essays and commentaries on some of my favorite cartoonists and illustrators. Um, and then the other one that I continue to do now is called uh, Vaz Comic. So virtually anything I've done in the past five years is you can find on, on the Vaz Comics blog. And again, probably the easiest thing to do, I could give you the URL, but it's probably easier if you just Google it, um, you know, under uh, under Vaz, it's V-O-Z-C-O-M-I-X. Mm -hmm. um, and like all the Mad Mummy stories are up there, all the Lori Lovecraft stories, the Retrowood stories. Um, so you can find it there. Okay. And you don't even have to pay. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, <laughs> and you got your own site, vazart.com, too, so that people right. can go there. I got my website. So, I mean, that's. Um, um, yeah, strangely enough, um, uh, my blog was extremely popular, but um, uh, I got blocked on Facebook. Um, I had had. You know, I had the life drawings and things like that for years up, and nobody said anything about them. And about a year or two ago, I, I uh, who was the, 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 the young activist who did a, um, is, it, is it Greta uh, from Scandinavia? Thornburg. Uh, yeah, made the cover of Time magazine. And I, and I put, you know, congratulations. You know, it's good to see young people showing us the way in terms of how to, uh, you know, start solving some of our problems. Very next day, I had people complaining about my life drawings, you know, and it's uh, <laughs> and and after that, I was got I've been blocked since then on Facebook for you know I, I can't reprint anything about uh, you know the the article I did on Norman Rockwell I you know I can't I can't mention on Facebook anymore so uh, so I switched uh, I reprinted some of those in the Vod, you know the Voss comics mm -hmm. so. And that's V-O-Z with a, with a Z, not an S like your normal name. So Right. Yeah. My abnormal right. name. <laughs> Same thing with the art <laughs> website. It's V-O-Z-A-R-T dot com. That's right. right. Um, like the art sale we're having today. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So uh, I guess we, you know, we could probably just segue into the art sale unless we wanted to. I haven't seen any real, you know, questions uh, in from the audience. I mean, I guess one thing, Mike. I mean, you're you in your studio right on, now. And on and on still. Oh, hey, we we can do that. No, I was gonna say you are in your studio right now, right? This uh, right. The, the space you're in. So I, I I was curious. I mean, do you take commissions through your websites at all, or is do you not have time for stuff like that? Um, no, I'm retired, so I take commissions, but yeah. um. You know, commissions are always like, oh, that'll be fun, um, depending on what you want. I mean, it's, it's uh, uh, it, it, for the most part, the one thing I miss about, about being retired is like the audience is no longer there. So, I mean, I'm still doing work uh, that's, that's, you know, the, the, as good as anything I've done, but nobody sees it anymore. So it's nice when people, you know, will, will you know, you get a commission. Uh, and I try and keep them reasonable because, because like I said, hopefully they're my fans. Um, and uh, uh, I, I'm not an artist where you're going to see my work suddenly appear on eBay for thousands of dollars. Uh, you know, it, so I don't have to worry about people uh, um, reselling them for the most part. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, no, I and, and generally I enjoy them because. Um, most of them aren't editors, so they don't have little, you know, oh, no, make sure you turn it a quarter inch this way and, and uh, you know, and make sure you get that weapon up. You know, it's, it, there's not a lot of direction that way. So uh, all in all, uh, the commissions are very fun. Excuse me, very fun. Okay. So, and just contact you from any of your websites to, to on make my website, you can find my, um, my email address on there and, mm -hmm. and do that. Okay. I'm not a person that, you know, it's like, like I'm not hiding in the middle of a Tahunga any place, you know. <laughs> now we've, we've gotten, a, Andrew Gorlick has asked about your experience with American Flag and First Comics, but I know, I think we're going to be showing a, an artwork 
in the sale that we might be able to kind of talk more about that at that okay. point, Andrew. So I know you've Andrew's asked a similar question twice. So maybe when that and that's an early piece in the sale. So we could talk right. about that then. So uh, so would you would we like to move into the art sales side of things? And we'll, and of course we're going to be talking about your you know, your art and your career throughout it because we want you to talk a little bit about each okay. piece that we're going to show. Chuck, I think that's your call in terms of. Yeah, yeah, I think that that's exactly what we want to do. So if you haven't had your question, a, you know, answered at this point in time, we're we're going to go through from Mike's early years through some of his latest paintings that he's been doing. So there'll be uh, you, you can sort of align your questions to that point in his career that we're going to be uh, showcasing pieces from. But you know, for the sale, we've you know gone through Mike's files. Mike was kind enough to invite me over and uh, you know pick out things. A lot of these things are things that frankly were in his personal collection. Uh, that he's kindly partnered with at this point for fans. Uh, and then I know there's one, the first piece that we're going to be doing, was showing, showcasing here was a special commission that you did just for the sale. Um, so it's a cover recreation that we'll get into. But uh, Bill, maybe I can also just say as far as how, how this was going to work. Uh, so when we do the art sale, um, we've done this in the past for those that joined us for the Gerhard sale. If you can send me an email, and I think Bill will have this up on screen at C-O-M-I-C-O-N-X-I-O-N, that's Comic Connection in a strange sort of spelling at hotmail.com. You can also just go to my um, comic art fan site. What, what we're gonna be doing is I'll actually put the pieces up on the comic art fan site so you can look at it in more detail, blow it up. Uh, and also it'll, over time throughout the sale, since we'll have 30 pieces of art here, you can see which ones may still be available for sale. But this is a, a claim sale and that the first person that sends me an email at that email address or through comic art fans, which it'll, it'll filter straight to that uh, email address, will get the piece and I'll, I'll make a note and I'll uh, let people know when a piece has been reserved. Uh, and as I said, we'll, we'll have 30 pieces in total that we'll be going through for the sale and uh, we'll contact you afterwards to arrange for things. Uh, one thing that I did not put in the, the terms and conditions, so to speak, of the sale that Mike was kind to of offer for those that want to pick up hopefully multiple pieces. Um, if you need time payments, Mike is willing to do up to a three month time, time payment plan on those. Um, so keep that in mind as you uh, reserve a few pieces uh, and, and hopefully that'll allow you to do that. And then um, just for shipping, just so folks are aware, um, it's a flat $50 for folks in the U.S. For those folks that are international, Mike will work with you afterwards to figure out what the shipping will be. Um, but if you buy one piece or, you know, 10 pieces, it's still a flat $50 shipping rate. And that helps to cover sort of postage and handling. Mike's going to get a, a little assistance to pack these up afterwards uh, from, from uh, somebody there. So uh, the fifty dollars will help cover to make sure that we can get those packed up and out to you in a timely manner as well. Anything else that I missed there, Bill? No, not at all. Just uh, just for the people who are used to uh, this, like the dueling dealer show, this isn't a claim sale where you're typing claim in the chat. You need to email Chuck at the the email address we just showed on screen. That email address is going to be on every slide that we show as well. So just you know, have it typed out and handy first person who emails Chuck will be the one to get get the, any of the artworks that we're going to show today. Just make sure you put the lot number in with your email when you send it yeah. to him. And, and like Chuck said, he's going to be turning these on in his calf gallery that uh, I did just paste into the uh, YouTube chat just now. So you can go over to Chuck's gallery that way so you can see the art in more detail there. And I have full size scans here as well. So if somebody wanted me to pull up one on screen, I can do that and we can zoom in a little bit if you wanted to. But I think the slides that I'll be showing are are representative enough and certainly check, checking out Chuck's gallery will be the other way to see those images. Yep. And I'll have the images here too. That's true. Yeah, you've got the actual artwork, yeah. Right. Yeah. All so right. If you want so Mike to don't... pull it out and show it to you, just let him know. Um, all right. So. I guess, Bill, I'll get the first one queued up. So in three, two, one. All right. Mike, do you want to talk about, so this was a special commission that Mike did just for the sale. Uh, and I know you haven't done many GI Joe recreations. I know a lot of folks want them, but uh, not necessarily always uh, available. You've only done one other one. Mike, do you want to talk a little bit about this one? Um. Uh, yeah, I think you pretty much covered it. It's in terms of, um, for the most part, people are interested in the GI Joe artwork, but not not a lot of recreations. I get a lot of character requests or, or commissions, but uh, I think this cover and uh, what's the other one I did nine are probably the only time I've ever done recreations of covers. Um, 
So um, uh, I think one of the problems is just for me for doing them, their their work, um, their their you know their. Um, in essence, when you're doing a recreation, you're becoming a forger. So it's, it's. I, I mean, as an artist, I might look at them and go, you know, I would change that figure. I'm going to draw, you know, I'll, I'll adjust this or whatever. Um, uh, you don't really have that luxury when you're doing recreations for the most part. Uh, they want them as close to the original as possible. But Mike, I mean, of your original covers for G.I. Joe, how many have uh, surfaced? Uh, sort of a I'm leading sorry. question. How many have uh, been? How many? How many have surfaced on the market? I, I guess I can answer that myself, which is zero. Um, okay. uh, you know, uh, and I think part of that is, and maybe you can tell a story, is that a lot of your GI Joe artwork uh, you ended up giving away or selling for a small amount of money. And frankly, I've never seen one of your covers ever come to market. So those that are actually looking for the original covers, frankly, as a longtime GI Joe collector, I've never seen one. So. Um, so Mike, do you want to talk a little bit about what what may have happened to the G.I. Joe artwork? Um, again, when you got artwork back from Marvel, it was split up. So, I mean, um, I'm sure some of it went to the anchor. Um, and, but what I would get at the time, I mean, as, as we talked about earlier, comic book fans weren't interested in G.I. Joe. Uh, they were kids who, who bought the toys. So, I mean, if I went to a convention and I showed somebody G.I. Joe artwork, that was like, pfft, they weren't interested in that. Um, so in terms of sales, if I was selling it for 10 bucks a page, um, it was like, great, you know, take it. For the most part, I would run into kids and I would just give them a page. Uh, I mean, you know, cause they'd be like, oh yeah, I really like that comic, you know? And for me, it was like, I don't want this stuff. Uh, I didn't have any attachment to it. Um, so, probably a good part of it is this wound up in the, um, uh, you know, in, in somebody's um, uh, trash ban uh, after they started to get rid of their, their toys. Uh, they didn't know what to do with comic book artwork. I mean, they they didn't understand it. Um, so, I mean, a lot of it has just probably been destroyed over the years because um, there wasn't a collector who originally picked it and, and put it in his collection someplace. Mm -hmm. so, so, Mike, what... I was yeah. just going to ask, what's the size of the recreation? I remember you held it up earlier before we got on went online here. So, um, basically, comic book. Um, uh, we're all done ten by fifteen. I did this one ten by fifteen full bleed, so it's on eleven by seventeen sheet of paper on on you know on Bristol board. Yeah, Very and, nice. and I've and Bill, if you want to show, this is the original comic book. Uh, people will remember it. Um, so you can sort of see the, you know, the detail, very, very obviously similar to it. And I think what's great about this one. So Mike, the only other one you've done is the nine cover, which was a Scarlet cover. Uh, this one features obviously more Joes. You've got Stalker, you've got Gung Ho, you've got uh, Snake Eyes there. And I think, you know, with the Snake Eyes movie just about to hit, um, I think Snake Eyes is really going to take off as far as a character that people are going to uh, take notice of, at least in the, in the more pop culture world. Um, yeah, I've heard really great things about the new Paramount movie that's coming out. So expect the expect the GI Joe to get hot once again. So, as I said, you know, Mike and his entire career has only done two of these recreation covers, only five hundred bucks. If you want one, I think this is your your chance to get one because there may not be another one coming anytime soon, unfortunately. I think I'll total. I, I we talked about this. I think like you only did five covers, something like that. Yeah, because other ones were done by. I know Trimpy did some of those, but then there's some some lesser known artists that did some of the other covers. And frankly, they're all very scarce. Uh, all that early GI Joe art, whether it's yours or Herb's or even Frank Springer's um, from those early issues, just doesn't pop up. Um, so I think having a recreation by the original artist, you know, frankly, at a, a relatively reasonable price, I think is a, is a great thing. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Well, well, we'll put that and you can think about it. We'll continue to have it available for the sale. And so mm -hmm. if anybody wants it, just send me a note and say you're interested in lot one and I'll go ahead and reserve it for you. But let's move on to the second one. All right. Here we go. Or are you going to turn right. these out? I'll, I'll, you tell me when. I'll, just, I'll do the countdown. Three, two, one. All right. So this was a, com I guess not even say a commission that you did, but uh, it was a piece that you did, a specialty piece that you did with the GI Joes. Um, uh, Mike, do you want to talk about your wash technique or, uh, or you know, some of these larger wash pieces that you did? Um, 
yeah, one of the uh, the illustrators that I really loved is a guy named Robert Fawcett, who used to work uh, basically with kind of transparent medium uh, in terms of doing um, uh, washes. So I thought it'd be a good idea to do the the Joe characters, but not try and, and approach them as like a, you know, a full painting, uh, but then do, you know, s set them in the middle of a, you know, a combat situation in a, you know, burnout, uh, bombed out city um, and use the, um, uh, the colored ink uh, to put washes on in the background, use the, you know, the, the sepias and the browns to kind of separate that. Um, and, uh, again, I was working a little larger than normal. I think these are, are what, the 13 by 18, something like that. Yeah. I mean, the, the full size is 15 inches by 18 and a half inches. Right. So a relatively large piece. So yeah, probably the largest GI Joe commission you've ever done. And, and, and the equivalent of you know, almost like a, a twice up cover. No. But yeah, yeah again, sort of more detail. Yeah, that's that's great. And I know Scarlet was probably one of your favorite characters to draw. I guess of the Joes, Mike, is that probably a, a fair assumption? Um, yeah, these are actually three characters. I can give you their names. That's Scarlet, Snake Eyes, and and <laughs> oh wait, oh. is that Duke or Hawk? <laughs> that's always a tough one. Uh, and I do, by the way, have somebody that reserved lot number one. So thank you, thank you for that. I will send a re reply back. For some reason, it uh, I didn't get the original email, so I apologize. So uh, if you don't get if you don't get an immediate answer or you don't hear me say it on there, just send it again. It's possible sometimes things go to my uh, my uh, I guess my uh, junk folder. So I'll just I'll see if I can check that as well. That can but happen. This one has not been. Yeah. So uh, this one has not been yet claimed, though. So please feel free to claim it if you like it. And what was the size on this one again? 15 by 18 and a half. Oh, that's correct. So it's probably like a double page spread size, something like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, this was, this was fun to do just in terms of... Um, when you work smaller, it really becomes, you have to, to get involved with like the fine lines and things like that, which is not my specialty. Um, so, you know, as you're working bigger, you can simplify what you're doing um, in terms of the line work and make sure that you use, um, you know, shapes around it to pop things out. So it's a, uh, Hey Chuck, uh, somebody mentioned that the uh, the artwork for the lot two isn't showing it, and I and if I hop over to oh, that, it's it's a different artwork that's showing. Yeah, let me check in there. Oops, or if it's not on yet, actually, I don't think I do have a lot. Well, let me see. I apologize. It's not allowing me to edit that very easily, but. All right, there we go. It should be up now. Or did it already show the other one? I'm putting the link back in the chat too. Alex Moreno asked for that. And uh, that's the link to Chuck's gallery. And if you go down to the new items uh, or just click over to the Mike Vosberg Live Art Sale gallery room, you can follow along there. But yeah, so definitely a really nice commission here, Mike. Thank you. I've even pasted the uh, URL directly into the gallery room with the artwork for everyone. All right. All right, shall we move on to the next piece? And sure. again, you guys grab the, the sale. Yeah, there you go. That's... Uh, yeah, this is counterintuitive the way you have to move these things. So they can it see. is. It, yeah. I've been doing this for a year and I still can't get it right. <laughs> so, all, all right. right. 
All right, we'll update the next one in three, two, one. And this is the American flag artwork. Mike, do you want to talk about your uh, your time on American flag? Um, I moved out here in 85, and I think a couple years later, Chaikin moved out. Uh, and we had been good friends in, um, you know, in, um, in New when I'd go into New York, I'd always see him. Um, and he asked me if I was interested in, in uh, you know, uh, doing a, a, a flag series with him, which was like I jumped at the chance because um, I thought flag might have been the best comic book series that was done in the 80s. Uh, graphically, story-wise, it was like anything that was out there. And it was always very funny, um, very hip, very contemporary. Um, and um, uh, it also it was it was a a learning experience because I worked on something we call duo shade board, where you could put on this uh, you know the dot pattern light and dark, and for me, um, it forced me to look at the drawings not just as a line drawing but as um, you know, full light and tone on them. So I really had to start to push the drawings to take them uh, farther than, than I had been doing before. And, and working with Howard was great because he had just this incredible sense of graphic in terms of how big do you show something, uh, you know, how do you set it up. Uh, so working with him, I learned an awful lot about uh, just that that whole process and and uh, uh, you know more about graphic sensibilities. Uh, the stories were always fun, and um, I had always worked on my comics pretty much by myself before. This was the first time I kind of worked in a um, a studio situation where um, Howard was uh, writing the stories along with um, John Moore at the time. So I'd get like a a plot from them. I would lay it out in, uh, you know, like a, a series of, um, you know, of, of um, uh, pictures rough it out. Um, we would transfer, I would transfer it to the boards and I would draw all the characters. And uh, we had this great artist, Richard Ory, would do the backgrounds. Um, and um, anything at the time, John who was a writing the series came in and would do the, uh, the, the coloring on a blue line process. Um, and, um, it was, it was kind of fun. Um, a little nerve wracking at time cause you had a lot of different personalities. Um, but, um, um, for the most part, it was, uh, it was a great experience in terms of, um, uh, of, of putting the series together. Unfortunately, um, it was done by First Comics, which was not the best business place to be at at the time. So uh, sales were very poor. Uh, just um, uh, it was uh, that was kind of the weakness of it. But, and we also worked with uh, well, I never met him um, with um, uh, probably the best letter in comics there with uh, Ken Brusnack. And I mean, one of the things that he worked with was Howard was that the lettering was an integral part of the actual artwork. Um, I mean, certainly Alex Toth took this approach is uh, lettering wasn't something you just pasted on. It was, it was supposed to be a part of the graphic. So when we designed the pages, you kind of had an idea of what you want to do. And, and Kenny would always take that and take it a step further with like, he's really, uh, fascinating fonts that he would come up with for the uh, uh, for the lettering and you know uh, his balloon placement and size was always you know, well thought out um, so it was a real it was always a real pleasure working with him I think he also did my offcast series and um, no, it's got to be a couple other things that I worked on um, but um, and Mike, I, I, Bill just zoomed in on it. There's a little Gumby on the right hand side. I don't know if people <laughs> notice that, but what was that? Is that you that did that, or is that Richard Ori that threw that no, in there? Richard, the I thing? think everything that Richard did, he didn't sign it. So Gumby was his signature. <laughs> if, you know, if, if you look through the comics, you can find in in uh, you know they're like uh, what's the guy Hirschfield. 
that used to to write Nina, um, which is his daughter's name, and and put it into the the artwork itself. So you just saw these you know these series of kind of jagged lines. Uh, Richard always had the Gumby that was uh, you know in the background there someplace. Um, he also did a lot of the work with me on the Tales and the Crypt covers, but I don't think we allowed Gumby to be in there for those. So. <laughs> I haven't seen any on any of those, but yeah, yeah, interesting thing here. Okay, well, this is lot three, folks. Uh, again, 450, the size on it is 11 and a half by 16 and a half, so a little bit larger than uh, normal comic art, but pretty much standard modern size comic art, but art. But as you say, it's on that duo shade, um, mm -hmm. which you don't see too often. I know, uh, you know Eastman and Laird use that for the, the early turtle stuff as well. Um, and as Mike said, too, they ended up reducing this and using uh, blue lines, which weren't as common, but, you know, what they used for Dark Knight and some of the other sort of premium versions so that they could actually print from the color directly when they did American Flag. Mm -hmm. And Mike, I know out of your collection, this is the last splash of American Flag art that you actually own. So, again, if somebody's looking for a piece, this was this was all we could scrounge up as far as, the you know, sort of being the very last piece coming directly from Mike. So. Uh, if you want to claim it, please do send me the email at c-o-m-i-c-o-n-x-i-o-n at hotmail.com. And you can reserve this, lot number three. All right. All right. We're gonna move, moving we're on, on to lot four. All right. Three, two, one. And this is Starfire, Mike. Right. Let's talk about your... Your uh, about this page and your your time on Starfire. Starfire was fascinating for me. Just I think it was probably the first series that I worked on. I was working at DC Comics and I was doing it with the uh, Joe Orlando. And um, we have a claim for lot number three. Just so everybody knows, the American flag now is gone. But sorry, go ahead, Mike. Um, so um, so Starfire was was uh, was was great. Um. You know, I got to do a barbarian woman, and that was fun. Um, the costume was actually based on there was an um, an Italian artist named Guido Crepex, who, mm -hmm. uh, um, like I said, uh, always had these. I think it was from a, a character that he called Valentina. Valentina was a model, uh, you know, a photographer's model, and did a lot of movies and things and. Uh, there was actually, I think there was a movie made of, of her uh, uh, in the in the 60s. But uh, I, I always found it very funny because I'd be working with Joe. And one of, you know, it was like, he was a guy who really appreciated art. But he would tell me, go, Mike, you're looking at these Europeans too much. And uh, I had to laugh because, I mean, he meant it in a very nice way. Uh, the, the problem with the Europeans is that they were very concerned with drawing and um, uh, uh, that approach, where with Americans, there's much more graphics, and um, like I said, the Kirby approach of of everything you know coming at you. Um, so he was he, he was trying to be you know it's like if you want to be successful, you should stop looking at them and look at, at uh, some other influences. But um, actually, this piece um, I actually inked part of all of the uh, the shadow characters at the bottom. Um, were, were things that I did. Um, um, the inker on the series was, um, I think, um, it was it Bob Smith did the first issue, which was great. Uh, and then uh, Vinnie Coletta took over, and quite honestly, for what I was giving him in pencils, Vinny did an amazing job on the series. Um, but uh, he and I would always run into the problem was, was I tell him, like, like you know, I, I don't dislike what you're doing, but it, it's not you. I want to ink my work myself. And I don't think he ever really, you know, he understood that he took it more as a personal, like, oh, you don't, you know, you don't like my inking. And it wasn't like, no, he is, as far as inkers go, Vinny inked my, my work as well as anybody. He, he would take my pencils and bring something to them. Um, I think the problem with Vinny was that if uh, Frank Rosetta gave him a job, he probably looked just like what I gave him. You know, he would, he would take the good stuff and it would take a step backwards. But, I mean, for a guy like me that was just starting out, all the weaknesses that I had, he corrected with his inking in a lot of cases and brought a nice, very slick look to it. Um, so, um, 
But uh, I, I love what he did on the series. And, and uh, uh, Chuck, you were asking me who the character was. And I can't remember other than the fact that she was kind of like some uh, uh, sorceress or whatever. But what I do remember was uh, my influence for that was uh, the great um, um, illustrator uh, Bob McGinnis, who um, hmm. um, I, I, I remember, you know, uh, having several phone conversations with Bob. And, I, and the first one I was telling him, he was like, how do you even know who I am? I was saying, like, <laughs> everyone in comics in the 70s, we all had your work on our desk to find out, like, okay, this is what we're supposed to, you know, this is what beautiful women are supposed to look like in, in comics. He did probably every paperback cover that came out in the 60s, um, did the movie posters for several James Bond, um, you know, uh, Gator with Burt Reynolds. I mean, just uh, but fabulous artist and um, uh, his – his women were um, in in my era. Um, the typical woman you were going to see on a paperback cover was uh, like a Mamie Van Dorn or Jane Mansfield. You know, very kind of zoftig blondes. And McGinnis started doing these fashion models that were like very long, elegant, and you know, uh, but looked like they had muscles like steel. Um, and that's what I wanted to use for my heroines when I was drawing them in comics. I think, uh, you know, I was not looking at, at mostly comic book artists at the time. It was like, I was always looking at Bob McGinnis for how to draw women. And the, uh, the shadow creature at the bottom sort of reminds me, you have a page from Joe Kubert in your studio from a story from Brave and the Bold 36. That looks a lot like the, the shadow guy from, uh, from, from Brave and the Bold. Oh, I can't imagine that I would ever look at Joe's work and be inspired by it. <laughs> yeah, of course not. No, I mean, at that cover is one of the most fantastic things I've ever seen. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's, uh, yeah. Um, I mean, Kubert was a guy, when I was a kid, I liked reading comics. Kubert was the first guy that, that when I saw Hawkman comics, it was like, whoa, this is what I want right. to do for a living. Uh, you know, this is, this is, I want to draw like this. All right. Well, that is the only Starfire page we are going to have for folks that were maybe wondering. And in fact, it's the sort of last of the DC artwork that we have from Mike. Um, so if you're looking for an example of his earlier DC art, this is a great one at 400. Uh, sizes, normal comic size art, 10 by 15. And uh, it's still available. It's lot four if you guys want to send me an email and reserve it. But otherwise, I guess let's yeah. oops, keep, keep checking Chuck's uh, gallery as well. So you can see yep. what uh, the better scans look like. That's right. So piece one and three have now sold, but two and four are available. But we'll move on to number five. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of interest from this. This is uh, the one and only piece that you'll have from Tales from the Crypt. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, yep. Here, I'll switch to Mike. We can show, it, show us the size, Mike. Yeah, because you find this kind of interesting. What this is is... Um, again, this was, was what we shot from when we were doing the, the films. Uh, there's an overlay, and on the overlay, right. you've got and it's the gone. <laughs> um, and underneath it, yeah, how to take this off so that you can see it here. Underneath it is a painted, uh, done on the blue line. Um, you know, so... Um, so it was all done with, uh, I'm not sure what I was using on that, whether it was a uh, gouache or acrylic at the time. Um, but uh, um, it was it was always an interesting way to work because you, you know, um, and of course the logos at the top were always uh, basically, we we Xerox those and pasted them up. Same way we use it, you know, production. But um, I'm trying to remember who was in this. I think that was with Hector Elizondo. Was That's correct. Guy and John, I think he played Luther in, in the Superman uh, movie. Um, I've got it in my Tales book here, but uh, um, I have to remember his name. But yeah, I mean, I think that those, they're, you've never released a uh, color cover, at least a published color cover before. Um, they're all in a, a private collection at this point in time. There's been some black and white ones. So that was a real special piece 
that I know you uh, have been holding on for quite some time. So congratulations to the person who reserved that one. Uh, a true, you know, special part of the Tales from the Crypt history. And uh, as I said, the only only one of those color ones that's that's going to be out there. So congratulations. Yeah, most of the, the color work is still in the, the collection of Joel Silver. So <laughs> I wasn't going to reveal it, Mike, but <laughs> <laughs> but yes, by uh, one of the people involved in the productions. Um, all right. So shall we go on to the next one, Bill? I am ready when you are. Six, one or three, two, one. And it's from Sisterhood of Steel. You want to talk about your Sisterhood of Steel time a little bit more, Mike? Sure. Um, Sisterhood of Steel was done for, um, what was that, Epic Comics. And um, uh, you were, Marvel was, was, was at the time um, to keep the talent happy. They were uh, offering what they call creator-owned um, series that you could work on. So you retained, uh, you know, the rights to the character or whatever. Um, and uh, it was a great idea. Unfortunately, what they didn't tell us was that um, we're not going to do much much uh, promotion or publicity of this because it's not ours. Um, so um, basically, you have to do the books. You get a shot, and, and, and uh, that was off. But it was created by um, Christy Marks, and I mentioned earlier in, uh, in terms of uh, who was writing the uh, – a lot of the GI Joe animation, um, and um, it was great because we worked fairly closely on this. I mean, I I would get the plot, I would design characters. I've got an entire sketchbook in here someplace of just uh, you know the GI Joe characters, their initial concepts and designs and things like that. Um, you know, she would you know say, yeah, that's this is the kind of thing I'm looking for, um, and um, um, the big thing for me was I got to ink the book myself for better or for worse. Um, and, um, um, yeah, I think for, for Marvel, I guess, even though it was independent, it was interesting that it was a very female centric, uh, one of the very first sort of Marvel female centric books right? that, that focused on a, a, a set of strong women. Yeah. Um, I mean, basically they were like, they were kind of like, you know, the Amazon island or whatever and um um i said i would i would thumbnail the book in terms of you know doing quick little pencil sketches and um um you know again run those by uh um christy normally see whether she had any problems with like you know story points who were missing um uh, it was kind of it was a fascinating story it was it was it was extremely well written um and it was a joy working with christy because most of the guys I, I worked with or you know, a lot of the guys I worked with in the industry, they were, they were comic book fans and they were always a little, you know, like, oh, I don't want to upset anybody. And Christy was like, he just did not put up with any bullshit from anybody. <laughs> you know, it's just, um, so if there was a problem with the book, um, you know, the editors or the writers or whoever you heard about it, you know, and it was, um, um, she, you know, um, she was great to work with that way. Um, Mike, do you want to show the, the size of the piece? Because this one is actually larger than a, a twice up. Um, and I think that's what's very impressive about it. Is yeah. That it's, it's pretty huge. As, um, it's all on one board. Yeah. It's basically, it's, it's a double page spread. But it's also a double page spread with a full bleed. So I think the size of the page is probably, what, 22 by... 28 something like that I think. It's, well it's 19 and a half by 23 is the size of the page okay okay um and you know like i said this was going to be one page and and you can see there's there's a bit of uh rubber cement uh on there from um where the copy had been pasted up and editorial directions you know written at the top of the page here um things like that um so it was, uh, um, and I, I think it might have been the last page of the series. 
it is the last issue. I don't know if it's the last page or the second, you know, yeah, sort of at the end though. It's it might one page after that there was kind of a wrap up of, uh, but I, but I, and I think yeah. this was really the, you know, the kind of the, the finale of the series, uh, those yeah. two pages. And if it bothers people, I'm sure you could have an art restorer remove those glue stains or you could, you could actually put the, the word balloons back on there. But uh, again, you don't have much uh, Sisterhood of Steel artwork left. I know uh, people have asked for it over the years, and this is, you know, no more covers or, or big promotional pieces. Um, this is really sort of the big splashy piece that if somebody wants a Sisterhood of Steel example, this is really the last thing that you've got to, to offer. So, okay. Um, wanted to update lot number two, which was the GI Joe commission has now been claimed. So thank you to the person who claimed that. Well, we're, we're moving along. That was a fantastic one. Congratulations, whoever picked that up. Yeah. All right. Let me just make sure they know they got it, and then we can move on to the next. Yeah, I hope everybody is following along with Chuck's gallery too, though, because he is getting yeah. those updated there. Yeah, and I'm putting sold next to the pieces that are sold. So if it doesn't have that next to it, the odds are that it was still available. But just reach out to me, and I will let you know. All right. Well, in three. By the way, those pieces that have sold, I'm I'm very flattered by you know by the buyers, and also just by by you folks out there that have actually an interest in this. Um, I mean, it's it's again one of the things that's really nice is like I continue to do to work, but I don't really have much contact with with an audience or whatever. So. Um, um, uh, so hearing from you in, in, um, places like this is, uh, yeah, it's like I said, it's a real treat. Um, uh, All right. I have to keep my head down. I noticed when I tilt it up, I suddenly, you know, these big green things show up in my eyes. <laughs> I'm not really an alien. So. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, let's re reveal the next piece in three, two, one. All right. So we're moving on from Mike's uh, sort of vintage work, if you want to look at to some of his more recent look. And we're going to offer, this is the first of two complete stories that we're going to be offering uh, for those that want an example of, you know, frankly, his storytelling, rare to be able to get complete issues. And uh, we think we pre price these pretty reasonably. Um, but Mike, do you want to talk about the Retro Award story here? Sure. Um, this actually comes from, this was... Um, I, when the first, I'm sorry, I have another uh, engagement here. I have to. <laughs> and, and while you're engaged, let me just let the folks know if you go to my calf gallery, you'll see other pages from the story. Obviously, we couldn't show them all here, but there are 24 pages here, and I've put them in the, in right. the calf gallery. Just go to the additional images, yeah. and you can see my, them all. Uh, oh, he's got them there, too. So. I did, yeah. I wanted to become involved in this whole process. So, yeah, this was the, the graphic novel, uh, the Retrowood graphic novel. Um, and it's it's like what uh, 180 pages, whatever. It was like the first four stories. Uh, the cover is actually will show up later in the sale. But what you're getting is um, a the the like you know the rough page that I would do the pencil page, and then I would trace that off and do the uh, the actual cover. Um, and so you have, you have literally the entire, the 24 page story, uh, in terms of, um, you know, just all the, the, the rough pages of pencils that I did. So it's, it's like, it's all still in, in kind of pencil form. Um, And then I would trace those pages off. And they're on the boards here. So you can, you know, um, um, the story itself was, uh, was, was kind of fun because um, I do a lot of figure drawing. And two of my favorite models um, looked very much alike. And we had a, a party one night with, with, you know, where we'd all go and we'd draw. 
and the models would all show up in like in like kind of their their different costumes that they were all doing. It was almost like a you know a costume party, and these two showed up as Siamese twins, and they both wore wigs, and I couldn't tell them apart. But I was just fascinated <laughs> by by like you know, the, these two you know gorgeous models, and they're just um, you know they're 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 the, the Siamese twins like that. Oh, there's a story there I got to figure out somehow. So that was uh, where the actual story came from. Was the uh, you know the the Gypsy Twins, uh, and Retrowood was uh, uh, like I said. It's basically it's it's Hollywood in the '30s, but I didn't want to be held back by uh, if you do a, a a period piece, every nut and bolt has to be carefully researched in terms of what shoes are you wearing? Those wouldn't have been available in 1936. They didn't come in until 1937. Uh, the cars, the clothes. So um, I actually wanted to do a story about the movies uh, of that time period. I think that's, that's the one thing I learned about Alex Toth was like, you know, Alex wasn't really interested in the thirties. He was interested in the movies of the thirties. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, so, I mean, with, with, with this stuff, uh, it was the same thing. I wanted, I wanted to do my own little private eye movies. Um, and uh, some of the stories were very whimsical. They were inspired by, like, you know, I, I was a big Will Eisner fan. Some of them were more hard-boiled because I also, you know, I wanted Chandler and Hammett. Um, and their, their, their writing style to come through with it. Um, but um, um, like I said, each one, it's like I cast uh, my favorite actor, I cast Gary Cooper as kind of the lead. And whoever would show up in these things would be, you know, a different little uh, uh, character sometimes. I think I had Bill Powell in one of them and uh, Marlena Dietrich and, uh, geez, uh, one of the later ones, I think it was Boris Karloff and um, – Bella Lugosi and um, uh, Warner Roland, who played Charlie Chan. Um, I mean, I love doing my own little versions of those stories. Um, and of course, uh, my cat showed up in that one too. So, uh, <laughs> and she's wandering around here now, making a lot of noise because I'm not paying any attention to her. So. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think this is great. I mean, again, showcases your, your storytelling abilities. Got a few different splashes in there that I think people will like. It also comes with all those, the, the prelims for the story. Although we've just shown the one prelim for the sort of the, the page one splash, um, it comes with a full set of prelims for this. So really to, to have an example of Mike's sort of drawing style, now you've got a little bit of a story behind why the, you know, sort of art uh, inspired by life, uh, which I think is a great story behind it as well. And uh, with many of the pieces, you get a picture of my cat. Yeah. <laughs> and the cat, of course, too. You'll get that with many of the pieces that Mike's going to be offering today. But uh, he likes to incorporate his uh, his feline friend into the story. But, um, yeah, I think that's we, – we have one other story that we're going to be offering in just a second. Bill, do you want to move on to that one? Uh, well, there was a question from Nick about sure. uh, since we're offering the cover for this story as well – you know how much it was because maybe somebody's going to want to buy the cover and the interiors. So I didn't know if you if you by chance wanted to just skip ahead to that one to to show it rather than doing the next uh, complete story. Sure, let's go ahead and do that. That's going to be lot eleven. So for those that are claiming it, if you want the the uh, the cover, but I would suggest if you know allowing if somebody wants both the cover and uh, the interior together you know, claim them both. So you've got lot number seven and lot, lot 11. We'd, we'd prefer it to go that way, but as you say, uh, let's, let's go ahead and show that. And okay. by the way, let me, uh, let me move on to that. only get it up and ready to go. Sure. These both come with a copy of the graphic novel, which now I'm down to very few copies of. So they're, they're, they're a hard one to find. <laughs> All right. You, so three, you can, two, okay. one, let's do it. There's the cover. So for only 450 for a fully painted cover here that goes along with it. And this was the first collection or the first cover that, or the painted cover you did, Mike? For the right, graphic novel? First, first Retrowood collection there. I think there were four or five stories in it. And uh, 
you know, for film buffs, you can probably pick out the uh, um, um, Gary Cooper, Madeline Carroll uh, uh, reference that I used to start from with this. From, uh, it's a great film called The General Diet at Dawn. All right. We have somebody that wants both lot seven and 11. So thank you. So the cover and the complete story all together. I always found it fascinating on these things because people, I get a lot of comments on the art, but nobody ever comments on the stories. And I'm like, um, and since you're writing these things too, it's always kind of like, well, um, you know, um, you want to get complimented on them both, of course. I mean, without well, question. I can compliment it, just, you know, get a response in terms of, of I mean, the, you know, in terms of like the Lori Lovecraft stories, I always seem to get a lot of response from in terms of, of what was there. Um, the Wretchwood, I think just fewer people had seen it. Mm -hmm. well, c congratulations to the buyer of both these slots because uh, yeah. it's very beautiful work. Yeah. Um, Bill, did you want to go back then to lot eight? Correct. Yeah, let's let's go hopping back to lot eight here. Thank thank you for the suggestion of showing them together uh, and asking for that. So feel free to to do that if you want. Uh, before we actually show this, I'll tee this up. So this is the second complete story that we're going to be releasing here uh, for a different title, which is going to be Voodoo Mansion. But it's the second and last complete story. So if you're interested again in a complete story. Uh, Feel free to claim this one. All right, three, two, one. And this is from Voodoo Mansion, a, uh, a slightly smaller in size story. Uh, and so the dimensions on this, just to let people know, are eight and a half by, tw or excuse me, eight by 12. So you did this a little bit smaller than you would, um, <clears throat> but it's an 11 page complete story, but comes with a, a, a few character designs as well, right, Mike, as opposed to the prelims, you decided to include the, the, those uh, those character designs. So yeah, what I did with this when I when I started on the story, and it has been claimed. Thank you very much. But please tell the story behind it, Mike. Um, you know, one of my favorite actors was uh, Timothy Oliphant, who did uh, Deadwood, and then he did the series Justified. Um, and I thought I would, you know, I do my Voodoo Mansion stories, where you know, at the Voodoo Mansion, the whole idea is. You walk into one door and you have no idea what room you're going to enter into. And you walk out that door and you know, have no idea where you're going to end up. So anyway, you know, it's, it's uh, kind of a metaphor for your psyche. Um, so anyway, um, uh, we've got the, the actor who shows up uh, because he wants to get back with his old girlfriend that, you know, he says, he, it's all these women that are always chasing after him, but he's like, he's got, I'm, I'm still after my one true love. So he goes back to uh, meet his one true love, and um, it doesn't end that aptly. <laughs> so, uh, um, but uh, again, it's it's. I think one of the problems of doing contemporary work is, as as a kid, I always wanted to work on Mad Magazine, and I would love those great. You know, Wally Wood would do them, and and Mort Drucker would do these. Um, uh, you know, uh, movie, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, players or whatever. And uh, that's kind of what I wanted to do with this one was just uh, poke fun with the, uh, you know, with the, uh, uh, the Western character. And, and uh, um, but I also found out in terms of drawing, when I worked in storyboards, I'd get a lot of really positive response from my approach to the boards, the way that the, 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 the drawings, the way they looked on the storyboard. And they would say, well, you really should do your comics that way. Uh, which is easier said than done because it's it's very much it's a spontaneous approach. Um, if it works, looks wonderful. If it doesn't work, it just looks like a sloppy drawing. Uh, but what I discovered was if I started to draw them a little bit smaller, um, again they're eight by uh, um, eight by twelve. Um, I tended to eliminate some of the 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 busy work that you would do in in um, in comic books. So it's 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 like um, the basic design stayed the same, but um, you know the size the size different. <laughs> I wasn't the first one to think of this. One of the comic book jobs I saw over the year that just blew me away was 
Um, Alex Toth uh, did a lot of movie comics when he was, um, uh, and one of them he did was Darby O'Gill and the Little People. And if you look at the comic books of, of all the books he was doing at the time, you can't tell any difference between them. But if you see the originals to Darby O'Gill and the Little People, he did them about two thirds of size. Or he actually did them almost just a little larger than the printed size. And the, and the fact that he was able to adjust his work to work that much smaller and still make it look just like, you know, like, like uh, uh, the large size originals, because those were big in those days. They were all 12 by 18. Um, uh, was, is, was, uh, was pretty impressive. Well, that, uh, so, so thank you for the person that, that purchased that. I know we had a couple people. So, uh, as Bill will probably remind you, be quick on your trigger if you, if you're interested in a piece. So that one went relatively, uh, quickly. And, uh, you know, again, two great examples of Mike's storytelling. We're glad that they will end up in the hands of fans. And by the uh, way, that, that story for anybody who wants to see it, if you go to the Vaz Comics site, uh, it's available. You can just go in the archives there, and you can find it. You can actually see it in color. Then, you know. So <laughs> there was color. What? <laughs> oh, yeah. And I, I did make a note that Nick Barucci asked for the uh, the book to be personalized as well from the the prior purchase too. So, uh, in case you didn't see that, Chuck, I, I made a note. Of it. Sure. Yeah. And, and I think, um, you know, if people want personalization of the art or if there are books that Mike's going to be uh, a company with these, um, that, the good thing is they're going to ship directly from Mike. So any of that type of stuff can be done. And, uh, and also, obviously, if you want to talk to Mike about getting a commission at the same time and shipping that out, uh, I'm not sure, you know, he can always ship that out later as well, but he could always ship it with your shipment as well. So um, just let me know if you want each page signed or just once, you know, whatever. Yeah, just give me some directions on that stuff because yeah i'm not yeah. an autograph person uh but yeah I'll, yeah yeah i mean i'll follow up afterwards and then any specifics that you have we'll make sure they get passed along to mike so that when he packs up the art it's it's the way that you like it so yeah. good thing about buying it from the artist okay well um so that was the only two complete stories that we had uh that we will be offering the rest of these pieces will be standalone pieces uh, well, not exactly standalone. So the next two, the next two lots are actually Mike's storyboard artwork. So not exactly complete stories, but sequences and or panels that you'll see together. So these are two lots of multiple pages. Um, and so each of them, I'll just, I'll just give a heads up that what we're going to reveal first, the, you know, the, are two different titles. So if you're interested in this title, please go ahead and pick it up. But this first one is going to be for spawn and I will release that in three, two, one. And, and I guess what I can say is here, these are, are a bunch, uh, it's a lot of 11. Um, there's actually four sort of individual pieces that are sort of standalone pieces. Uh, the first one that uh, had spawn in an alleyway, you've got a couple great violator pieces, and then you've got sort of a, a cityscape. The rest are a bunch of roughs. So there's, um, it's, it's a rough sequence. So you can really see how Mike lays out uh, a sequence when he was working on spawn, which again, you'll see spawn sort of in that final panel there that Bill's showing there sort of making his appearance, but these are the thumbnail roughs that Mike would do. But Mike, do you want to talk about your experience working on Spawn? Um, yeah, I step back and just in my experience working on storyboards is when I, when I give seminars or do a class or whatever, one of the things I really explain to people is you don't have to be Rembrandt to do this stuff. Is, you know, if you can draw a circle, square, and a triangle, you're pretty much composing where an image will be on the screen and how it will move across or into the screen. So if you can identify your character as like, you know, okay, this guy's got a triangle head with a circular hat, that's all you really need. Um, whatever drawing you do after this, it's icing on the cake. Um, I think, I, I remember one time working on GI Joe, we had this uh, film artist who came in and did uh, a, a storyboard for us and we all looked at it, it was just just like oh my god this stuff is crap you know it's just these rough little sketches um and none of us were astute enough at the time to really understand that yeah but what he did at his storytelling and it turned out to be a guy named uh uh mentor hubner who uh storyboarded a good part of blade runner uh <laughs> and is a really famous illustrator and um you know and, and board artist um so yeah that thinking process those little scribbles at the beginning, 
that's 90% of the work. If you get that right, all you got to do is, you know, the drawing is simple. Um, but um, yeah, working on Spawn was uh, probably one of the best jobs I had. Um, it's, it's, um, I, I worked for a wonderful boss named uh, Catherine Winder, who just um, has done her own, um, and she's just done a series now called, the, uh, it's on Netflix, and the name of it escapes me, um, um, which one of the problems I have as I get older. Um, but um, uh, we worked, um, uh, there was a whole group of us. I had um, Alec Radomski, who was a name, I don't know if you know, but everyone knows Bruce Tim. Uh, um, and uh, Radomski was probably just as important to that whole Batman series uh, as as anyone else. He was just, he was a great creative director and a really funny guy. I really enjoyed working with him. Um, um, but, um, uh, and also the two other people that I, I shared my office with eventually were uh, uh, Jennifer Yu and uh, Tom Nelson. Tom is boarding virtually every superhero movie that's made now. Uh, Jennifer wasn't happy with just winning a, a, an Emmy with the rest of us, and she actually went on and was nominated, the first woman to be nominated for an Oscar for her as a director for uh, Kung Fu Panda. Um, but we had a really talented group of people. Uh, they were all very friendly. Uh, I was probably 50 at the time, and I was the grandpa of the studio. Um, and uh, that, that was always, you know, was, was kind of fun. Um, uh, meeting Todd was, again, was an experience because I only knew Todd from, from interviews I'd see on Spawn and whatever. And I'd think, uh, you know, one of these young guys, I wasn't that impressed. And he was coming into the studio one day, and I'm kind of like, oh, man, you know, what am I going to say to him? And um, he comes over, he walks in, he comes over to my desk, and he just starts non talking nonstop for the first 15 minutes about, like, oh, Mike, he used to see you working comics. He used to love it. Oh, God, you're so, I'm so happy you're working. And, you know, by the time he was done, I was like, God, how can I do anything but love this guy? <laughs> you know, it was just um, – it, it, it was fun working for him. He had a real sense of knowing the little kind of, of um, you know, bits to put in with a character or the design or whatever that the audience responded to. Um, if you ask him questions about, you know, like, what's his character's motivation? He'd look kind of like, oh, I don't know. Um, but... Um, there were other aspects that you know others brought in that um, uh, I really appreciated working with him. Um, that was a fun project. Um, well, let me uh, let me just butt in to say that uh, on the uh, first two pieces, which was uh, Spawn in the alleyway and the uh, Violator piece, those two are eleven by fourteen size, so a little bit larger. The others are all drawn on eight and a half by eleven, so. Uh, I think those are those are legal size. Legal uh, size, yes. Oh, sorry. I, I said eleven by fourteen. I meant eight and a half by fourteen. Sorry. Yeah. Yes, legal size paper. Um, but yeah, I mean, rare. Very frankly, very rare to find any spawn artwork. I mean, even the McFarland stuff and the Capullo stuff uh, from the comic book side. Uh, very expensive if you can find it. But even on the animated series, there really isn't much around. And I think when you know Mike uh, had given me some stuff to look through, and these were really some of the best images that I found of spawn so i think if somebody wants a good spawn example uh whether you keep all of them or sort of break it up i think this is a great collection of, of mike's work on spawn and frankly you may not find too much spawn animated art out there um so i would suggest picking this up because this is the only lot that we're going to offer uh relative to the hbo stuff all right well again we'll keep that available and just to recap there are a couple lots that are still available um one of those is the uh Starfire, uh, 6, page 13, which is lot 4. Sisterhood of Steel, uh, 8, pages 26 and 27, which is that double page spread, which is lot 6. And then now this lot 9, which is the lot of 11 st spawn storyboards. But we'll, uh, we'll move on to the next, which is more storyboards, but from another well-known project, which is the very first Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe movie from the Chronicles of Narnia. There you go. I'll put it up. 
And, and when we see these pictures here, keep in mind there are 29 uh, storyboards that are here. Most of them are, t are two up. Mike can show some of those live so you can get a better sense of what they look like. Mike just compiled a few of the images here to give you a sense of the sequence that's in here. But very finished storyboards uh, for this line, the Witch in the Wardrobe, compared to some of the others. But Mike, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, and maybe you can show some of those live to us. Yeah, this is 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 like I said, they're all eight and a half by eleven size, and um, um, they're done in in um, marker and and um, and toned. Uh, and in I don't know if you're familiar with the movie or not. Uh, this is a sequence where the two girls follow Aslan the lion, who is about to sacrifice himself to uh, to save them all. Um, and um, it was it was just a real treat working on this movie in terms of um, you know working with uh, Adam Adamson uh, as the the director. Um, is um, these were were these? It, 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 I I wound up with this job um, at the time. Um, I had been working in comics, and uh, as you'll find out, if you're if you're an artist in the industry. Your your career is on a real roller coaster. Sometimes you're just you know you're the hottest guy in all of Hollywood, and the next time you can't get work to save your life. And this was kind of one of those those uh, patches for me where, uh, you know, it it's like um, work wasn't available. You know, I just nothing was happening in comics, nothing was happening in animation, and I happened to run into a friend, uh, Trevor Goring, who's another uh, excellent uh, cartoonist and storyboard artist in live action films. And he went, oh, you ought to come over to our studio and put in a portfolio. And I was kind of like, well, you know, I'll see what happens. And I dropped the portfolio off and thought that'll be the end of it. And about three months later, I got a call in from, uh, uh, you know, from the, uh, the Narnia uh, board. And I wound up with the best job I ever had for years. Um, I'm, you know, I wound up going to, to Prague to work on one of the films and New Zealand. And Mike, I mean, I could say from a, you know, sort of a movie collecting standpoint that The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe is, is one of the, you know, of the three was probably the most beloved of that. And I think this is a very memorable sequence. So from uh, a film, you know, perspective or somebody that's more of a, a movie prop collector perspective, these are sort of cherished pieces here to have something from the very first film. Um, so great that we're offering this to our, our fans out there that are fans of yours uh, first. But I think these are, you know, I think would be a sort of the prized uh, sort of storyboards from the from that. Oh, I think we moved on to another piece already there. <laughs> no, yeah, I should have, should have hid that window. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, again, we'll go through these. Um, you know, that that lot will still be available. That is lot number ten, which is the lot of twenty nine Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe storyboards. Um, which is $800 for that. So you let me know if you want to do that. We have, uh, we've already gone through lot 11. So we're actually moving on to lot 12. Um, and this is moving into more of Mike's work, uh, more covers that we're going to be offering from some of his more recent work, including we'll start with Mad Mummy. And let me go ahead and release that in three, two, one. Yeah, Mike. Uh, inspirations for this piece. This is you want to you want to talk about it. And, and the size on it is, I believe, this is ten by fifteen. Is that correct? Right. Yeah. This was actually um, um, again we mentioned the character Fu Manchu earlier. This was Fu Manchu's daughter, who in my Mad Mummy series. Uh, and this is this has been claimed a lot twelve, and it looks like we had two people that uh, chimed in. I will get back to you guys individually, but um, already claimed. But go ahead. Um, yeah, it was originally done in, and you get a copy of the Mad Mummy, uh, a very limited edition of this I did for uh, um, the three or four of the stories. And so this one is, again, is a, is a color story, um, you know, when, when it's all 
that way. But um, yeah, so it, it was basically you've got uh, you know I had the Fu Manchu character is kind of this you know he's very old. He's given up his whole idea about world domination, and he's much more interested in uh, just watching fantasy football. Uh, but his daughter is still out there trying to uh, take over the world, and uh, um, she's again the reincarnation of uh, the mummy's um, wife, who has him condemned to his uh, his death as a living mummy. So, uh, yeah, that's a like I said for me that's been a very fun series to work on. People are always going, "Are you the character?" that you designed for the mad mummy. And I was thinking, Oh great. I'm using Ralph, Ralph Fiennes for the, for, you know, for the character. They must think I look a lot like Ralph Fiennes, you know, so. Hey, uh, uh, flattery. All right. Well, uh, that one is sold. As I said, I apologize. We had three people that wanted that one. So, uh, thanks for all joining in. There are going to be a few more of these. And I would get your fingers ready because I'll be honest, this next one I think is going to go very quick as well. So three, two, one. Yeah. Mike, you want to talk about this one? I'll keep my eyes open for people to reserve it. Same character, um, different pose. Um, but again, it's it, it's basically in, in each and of those, it's I have to do a front piece to kind of break down who the character was. Um, and so that's kind of what this served in this one was just a, you know, just a, an explanation of who's the mad mummy, where does he come from, blah, blah, blah. And often I would add as a humorous things like, this girl has absolutely nothing to do with this story, but you know, um, Mike likes to draw him. So, um, again, the so I'll just say, oops, sorry, just to interrupt you, Mike. It's, it, this one is claimed because I keep getting there's like been five people jumping in. Unfortunately, it's claimed. I'll get back to everybody, but uh, yeah, good piece. <laughs> yes, congratulations. You got to be quick, everyone. Yeah, sorry about that. I will try to get back to folks. Um, but if you haven't gotten an email from me yet, then you know you have not gotten that particular piece. So I will get back to folks in just a second. And I mark this one sold so people know. But yeah, you can kind of tell some of Mike's pieces are going to go quick. And I think there'll be a few more of them coming up in just a bit, too. I try to be selective of the of the pieces that I like the best when we uh, we put these up for sale. So um, usually it's not a good sign because that means I can't get them later on. But, uh, but good for the folks out there that got them. All right. Exactly. Let me... The good news is... I'm not sure I've ever sold any of the Mad Mummy pieces before, and that there's there's three books of uh, you know with a lot of different stuff in them, and and um, so at a time in the future, if you didn't get one today, um, there are there, like I said, there are other pages that will be available because I did a lot of splash pages and a lot of of just standalone pages on these. Yeah. I want to see the book now. Okay, let me uh, let me clear through. And again, if you haven't gotten anything back from me yet, that means you hadn't gotten that particular piece. So you should uh, get your fingers ready for this next one. Uh, again, we'll probably go relatively quickly. And three, two, one. The as I call it, tomb fight. Mike, do you want to talk about the tomb fight here? Um, yes, this was. Uh, the, 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 the bad girl in the thing, this was uh, Nefertiti, who was uh, the, the woman who seduces the mad mummy and uh, uh, causes and all the problems. Law well, 14 is gone, so it's been claimed, so just so folks okay. know. <laughs> and this nice but go ahead. You know, Alanya. Um, I found this this morning, and I thought I would stick it in there and include it. There's the, uh, the pencil rough for the page, too. So you get a copy of the book, the page, and the pencil rough for it. Wonderful. So, congratulations again to whomever picked that up. Yes, and I apologize that I keep having to let people down. There was at least even before I said that there was two people that that climbed in. <laughs> um, so I apologize, and 
the the person there's one person I keep having to apologize to because they're literally getting beat out by one about one second. Um, so. Again, if you've missed out on these pages, you can go to my website and and contact me to see if I have anything else. And also, um, um, James Mealy on sequential treasures, I think might have a few of the Mad Mummy pages up from time to time. All right. Another okay. Goodbye. Let me uh, switch back over. All right. We're going over to uh, lot 15. Lot 15 it is. Okay. And this is a, uh, before we get to this, this is a larger piece. It's 13 and, 13 and a quarter by 20. So, all right. Hold on. Three, two, one. Thanks. So, Mike, do you want to talk about exotic and the inspiration behind this? Um, and once again, once I was kind of freed up from from doing things traditional, I thought I, I want to do some some uh, pieces that are a little larger, and also be able to put some tone work in them. Um, and uh, you know, one of the conceits that I worked with, and and I guess sometimes it's very successful, sometimes maybe it's not, is uh, I always tried to keep uh, the female flesh just white just so that it would you know uh, uh, just as a flat thing and whatever rendering was done would go on in the backgrounds so um, um, and and I wanted to do kind of a, uh, my pastiche of comic books of the 50s so I was doing some of these for you know like okay what were the you know, like Sheena and I'm um, trying to see who else were, you know, some of the, you know, the, the, the um, uh, female uh, heroines of the fifties. I want to do some, some comic book covers of what you'd see in the fifties. Um, so this was one of them. Um, and, um, you know, ironically, as I always tell people that the, the difference between an illustrator and an artist is, uh, you know, if you start out, to do a, a, a picture, you know, uh, of an apple and it winds up a portrait of George Washington, as an artist, that might be the best thing, you know, that might end up in a museum. As an illustrator, you're fired because it's like, it's great for George Washington, but we wanted an apple. And I think in this case, I started out doing another uh, Lori Lovecraft piece, but for whatever reason, it was like, it was a lot more effective with really, you know, black hair. So, um, um, I guess we can think of this as probably Lori and her uh, Barbara Steele wig. Um, so, uh, um, but yeah, this is. I mean, when you see it in person, it's it's got some weight to it, and that it's a, a very large piece. Uh, and I think it would look really great when you frame it up, especially with the with the wash in the background on that one. So, and again, one of your classic classic ladies. Or, uh, uh, there was a, a great uh, um, uh, Vincent Price movie called The Fall of the House of Usher. And there was all these these guys gesturing towards, you know, the, the you know, the character at one point. And they, that 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 whole scene has always fascinated me in terms of, uh, you know, uh, uh, just as a creepy scene in a film. Other people too, because I think whoever was somebody, whoever used it, Polanski used it in uh, uh, the same image in uh, Roman in uh, Rosemary's Baby. All right, well that's lot fifteen uh, available still for six hundred, and we still have a few other lots. Again, if you go to my calf gallery, you'll see the other ones that are still available. Mm -hmm. um, we've got one more, what I would call sort of miscellaneous pinup that's coming up here before. We sort of closed out this section as well. So we, we sort of closed out everything to do with Mad Money, Mummy. Um, but I think people will recognize the background in this one. So let's release this in three, two, one. Mike, it background looks a lot like where you're sitting right now. Um, one of the things that I found I was doing in a lot of these pieces, I was looking at backgrounds that uh, Robert Fawcett did in his paintings and, and you know just doing copies of some of the things that that were there and I realized, hey, look around your studio. You've got, you know, your own studio serves as an, office, an interesting graphic 
for what you're trying to do with with uh, this page. And this is a new character I created called Kriya, who uh, runs her own antique shop. And Mike, this is claimed, just so folks out there know. But go ahead. Keep going. Uh, and and um, um, Kriya's thing is that she tries to fit her her you know whatever antique she gets only goes to the right person. Um, so if, uh, if you're interested in this beautiful artifact from the past, but, uh, she doesn't think you really deserve to own it, you're not going to be able to buy it. Um, so, um, I don't have that same kind of control over my artwork. But, uh, I'm sure, you know, if people are interested in it. I'm very happy that you're able to get it. So, uh, uh, but stuff in the background are all these, you know, like, like, if you can see these little things, this is like, I think this is an Alex Toth page. Uh, you know, uh, another one is there's a, there's a Robert Fawcett illustration. And, and I mean, they're just the little bits and pieces. I think there's um, probably a Joe Kubert page in there that, uh, that fits in there someplace too. Oh, there's the bottom of it. That one you were talking about, Chuck. Um, you know, <laughs> so, uh, um, you know, there's all these little things that, uh, um, get a little slice, a little slice of Mike's life in that as well. So it's always mm -hmm. nice when you get something personal from the artist, you know, to sort of remember them by. And I, and then it gets the great thing about that piece is when you start doing that kind of thing. So little, little inside insights into the the life the life of the artist as well. Okay. Well, again, that one was claimed. I apologize. There was a couple people that wanted that. Thanks for for being uh, persistent in doing that. Um, but again, just to, to recap, there are some that are still available. Lots 15, which is the exotic pinup out of those pinups that is still available. That's at 600 and that's an oversized piece at 13 and a quarter by 20 inches. And we have these two storyboard lots as well as the sisterhood of steel and starfire page still available. If you look at my cap, but we'll move on to, uh, I guess the next portion of your career, which is Lori Lovecraft. Um, we're going to have a number of pieces from Lori here in just a second. And for this piece, although it's shown in the printed way with the uh, lettering on it, it does not actually have it. So three, two, oops, sorry, I have to push active, and then one. And Mike, this is one continuous piece of art as well. When uh, is that correct? Right. This was the um, the splash page for. Um, um, and it's been claimed just so folks know it's been claimed. Wow. Yeah. I was going to say it's, there's not a lot of Lori Lovecraft art out there anymore. Um, it, it was probably in my work. It's been the most popular thing that I've done. Um, and I understand also because it had more love in it than just about anything else I did too. I, I think the, you know, the, the Lori, uh, stories I was usually working for someplace else I was doing you know I was doing animation or I was advertising or whatever so the Lori comics they were just I was doing them on my own of like this is just exactly what I want to do so um, um, I, had, I had great fun with the character and um, um, just the whole series I really enjoyed And you had well, shown it, the you had shown the original earlier, so it doesn't have the word balloons on the original. Is that was that true? Yeah, here you can ah. see this. It's like the original is just basically just the drawing. There yep. is there are no words. You can make up your own words. So <laughs> very nice. But yeah, I, mean, um, I always I like that piece because now who, the, uh, who's the Mike? Who's the head behind Lori? Oh, that's just what I was saying. That's the, you know, the, the character that I used in this, the movie star, was actually William Powell, uh, the guy who played the Thin Man in, in, in the movies. And uh, he was always very, very debonair and, and very, you know, very light and humorous in his films. Um, and all those, those um, uh, where Laurie is at, uh, my wife and I took a trip to Scotland. So these were all shots of uh you know photographs that i took of the tombs in uh, one of the um um 
I think it was a cemetery in in Edinburgh. Cool. It has, yeah. it has a very rice and feel to me, you know. But yeah, uh, Alfredo said they thought that looked like Disney as well. I thought I thought the same thing when I first saw it. It looked like what? It, Walt it Disney. looked like looked like Walt Disney, uh, <laughs> in there. Yeah. It has that. If it was Walt Disney, it would have been a much darker story from my point. Of view. <laughs> Uh, you did have one question from uh, Tara Wombat wanting to know if you'd ever published uh, Lori Lovecraft in an omnibus. You know, odd that you should mention that because uh, one of the things that um, James Mealy has been asking me about, and, and I plan to do next year is the 25th Lori Lovecraft anniversary. So I'm going to put out a book of all the Lori Lovecraft stories, a lot of the sketches and artwork, and there's also a new little eight page story that uh, I'm going to have to prod. Mr. Ventrella and see if I can actually get him to, to write the dialogue for it. Um, cause I think it's been in the drawer for three or four years now. Uh, but yes, there definitely will be a Lori Lovecraft, um, um, omnibus, uh, coming out next year, uh, in a, in a very limited edition. Fantastic. Cool. All right, Bill, are we ready for our lot number 18? Again, this is another Lori lot. For those that are, I know it's going to be another hot lot, so get your fingers ready. Oh, Mike's already starting. All right, there we go. <laughs> Mike, you got to wait. You got to wait. <laughs> oh, okay. I didn't know if you wanted me to show this. No, I, no I, I put it up first, or Bill and I put it up first. But, but anyway, so this is up for sale. It's, <laughs> and it has, it has been claimed. It has been claimed. I'm I'm sorry to the, the people that keep getting built uh, that have been uh, beat out on this one. Because there's a few of you, I apologize once again. But go ahead, Mike, and talk about it. <laughs> well, whoever bought this, you just insulted Alex Toth because he'd always look at drawing like this and go, "What's wrong with you guys? Why can you draw women that look that disgusting?" You know. So, um, um, but actually, I, I think I did a, a couple different versions of this. I mean, certainly the the lions on the uh, on the chair are from uh, uh, Alphonse Mucha the uh, uh, incredible Czech artist um, of the uh, 19th and 20th century. Um, the cat at the bottom, I think, was was uh, a stray that we took in. Um, and Lori was probably, I'm trying to remember, you know, uh, from, from, Playboy or Plant House or whatever. I mean, it was, it was uh, actually when I started doing Lori, there was a conglomeration of, of actresses. The, the, the one that I use most consistently for reference was Anne Margaret. Just, just to repeat, I keep getting people wanting to claim this. This is already sold. So this okay. is already sold, folks. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I'll take it off the screen. Then. So, yeah, sorry. Right. It's sold. So, um, yeah, Anne Margaret was one actress that I would find that actually would get expressions on her face when you'd find pictures of her. Uh, all the other actresses, they tended to look beautiful, but they didn't want to give a lot of emotion away. Uh, but also there's a lot of Jane Fonda. There's a lot of Catherine Deneuve. Um, trying to think who else kind of fit in there. Um, you know, probably sure. I'm sure there were like two or three different Playboy Playmates of the Year or whatever that... Uh, uh, we're also kind of the inspiration. All right. All right. Let me. I, uh, I, I, and I can see all, all those as well. I was thinking Jane Fonda for some reason, but. Yep. I had the same thought. It looked very Jane Fonda to me as well. But. All right. Again, apologize that people that may not have heard me on that last one that it sold so quickly. Um, but again, we've got uh, one more, I think. Is two more, one more, Lori. More of those. Two more. We have two more. Oh yeah, we have two more Lori's. Okay, so they're not all gone yet, folks. They're not all gone yet. Let me update this. I apologize. I'm not looking at the camera, folks. I am multitasking. <laughs> okay. Right. Uh, so this is lot 19. If you haven't gotten a uh, confirmation that says you got it from me. You did not get it. Or if you got something that says sold or already sold, that means somebody else got it. So just so you can interpret that. Okay. So we've got lot number 19, which is another Lori pin up here. This is a little bit oversized at 13 by 20 in 
three, two, one. Okay, so far nobody's claimed it. So, <laughs> but Mike, you want to talk about it? Um, this is another one of the, you know, like I said, one of the ones that I I was doing with, um, um, you know, the the color inks and um, uh, did a little different on this one. I actually tried to to. This, was, this has been claimed, folks. Just so folks know, it's claimed. Um, oh, go ahead. But uh, and also, everyone always thinks Lori is a blonde. She's actually she's a redhead. You know, it's it's like that was a big part of the uh, one of the first stories I did was called my favorite redhead because the um, her boyfriend in the series is based on Bob Hope, um, and uh, that he did his, his famous you know my favorite brunette, my favorite blonde, my favorite spy. I thought if he was you know if he was going to be Laurie's girl or boyfriend, uh, he was going to have to do you know my favorite redhead. So. And by the way, you were talking about Jane Fonda earlier. There was the latest, uh, you know, Jane Fonda uh, Barbarella drawing that I did. So was that a commission for me? Yeah. No. Oh, for you? Okay. <laughs> it's just like, oh, that'd be fun to do today. When you're retired, you get to do what you want. I am envious of you, Mike. <laughs> One day. All right. So we're ready. Not, 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 what? not soon for me. But um, yeah, let me go ahead and sorry. I only I was just going to update that so folks knew there was a, a, like four or five I think people that claimed in on that one. So it's been fast and furious. So thank you. We appreciate the enthusiasm. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm sorry if I can't keep up as as, as much as there is enthusiasm, but uh, I try to keep everything updated on cast. So there is still the exotic pinup, which if you missed out on that one, you can go ahead and claim that. But you can. Uh, just reference lot 15 if you want that one. But we have one more Lori pinup coming up here. And uh, it's a doozy. So get your fingers ready on this one. It's a, uh, oversized 15 and a half by 20. Three, two, one. All right, Mike, do you want to talk about this? I know you used this on some of your cards and stuff in the past. I, I uh, so. actually use this one again. It's a large, large size, um, and I used it on um, basically my. Uh, I guess you'd call it a business card, um, and I mean, you know, what I would give to and when I go to a convention, I would pass these out. Um, and this one is now claimed. It is now claimed. <laughs> if you look very closely in the in the background there, you can see that that's actually. Uh, those steps, I think, were from Dracula Castle, and there's the vampire hanging around in the in the back. Um, it is, so. and um, the cats were, uh, um, I think, probably the same cat that I had three different poses of that I used. But uh, she was a wonderful little model. Well, again, this one's been claimed. Again, there was a few folks that uh, that chimed in on this one, so thank you for your enthusiasm. I'm only going to get back to one of you and say you got it. Yeah, it's a beauty. Uh, that is uh, that is my favorite of the uh, of the Lori pinups that we've had. I, I don't know, you know, I think it's partly the pose and the sort of the 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 white legs or you know, sort of the contrast of everything around it, and you've kind of got the shoulder and the legs that just sort of pop from it. But uh, love that piece from. But it's not going to my collection. It's going to another's out there. So congratulations <laughs> to those lucky people out there that are getting all the stuff that uh, I like today. All right. Well, we're moving on. Um, one thing I know we didn't get a chance to talk about, but I figure we have plenty of time here now that we've got a few pieces here, is Mike, is your um, career in real art. And uh, maybe as we talk about these particular pieces, we can sort of get into to more about your inspiration of these real art paintings. And uh, we'll start with one of them here in just a few seconds here. And this first one, three, two, one is Lady Gaga inspired this one. Do you want to talk about this one, Mike? Um, and, the, and the size is 14 by 13 for folks that are wondering. And, and again, a, a great, a great photo I found of her. 
I, you know, again, if you ask me to name two Lady Gaga songs, I don't know what they are, but um, she's she's a fascinating visual treat, and I love the building. And then I found out later it was actually designed um, uh, by Frank Lloyd Wright's son, um, and it's you know, so I can see why that appealed to me there. Uh, actually, I did a couple versions of this. First one I wasn't that satisfied with, and um, so I think I redid this one. Um, actually, when I first started working with Chaikin on American Flag, one of the things that I really wanted him to uh, to to give me some uh, art direction on and 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 help working with was I wanted to to learn how to paint, and become an illustrator. And so Jake can help me a good bit in terms of just, you know, learning some art techniques and things like that. Um, but it was, it was a process I continued on in terms of, I found that uh, often I look at paintings and think, I wish I knew how to, to paint better. And what I discovered was that, uh, no, the paintings are fine. Um, but you really know, how to, you, know, you have to learn how to draw better. If you draw better, your paintings will be better. So um, again, it's it's all the illustrators. Everybody had the same advice. You know, if you want to do, you want to get better to stuff, learn how to draw better. So I've I started going to figure drawing class. Uh, my friend Bill Stout had one every Sunday morning. We used to call it the appropriately the Church of the Naked Lady, and um, um, we had a great you know group of of guys there. You'd be sitting next to somebody like. Uh, um, uh, uh, Dan Gaze, who did a lot of movie posters, or Bill, or uh, you know, Dean Yagel is in the class, and, and I mean, wow. um, or you'd also have guys sitting next to you. Be like, you know, it's like uh, uh, I'm a I'm a musical lawyer, but I wanted to come and find out how to actually do some drawing. Um, but um, that was also really instrumental in terms of just you know, it's 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 just uh, I, I'm a compulsive. Um, um, sketcher. I mean, I, I've. I, if you look on the walls behind me, one of the whole bookcases is just filled with years and years um, uh, of continual drawings of, of life drawings. Uh, you know, uh, cats, plants, whatever, whatever is around. Just you know, sketches of others, cartoonists. Um, so. What I started to do was I started to try and, and teach myself how to paint uh, using watercolor and then moving on to acrylic because uh, I thought, well, geez, it'd be great, you know, to do movie posters because uh, I always like drawing likenesses of, of movie stars and that. Um, and um, I went to a seminar one night that uh, um, Drew Struson gave. Uh, who's who does all the uh, the the Star Wars and the Indiana Jones and every other movie poster, and this was in the, probably the early '90s. And um, um, he asked, he said, "Well, how many people here are illustrators?" Virtually everyone raised their hand, and he just went, "Oh my God, I hope you're not here to to learn how to to get into you know the business of drawing movie posters because I haven't had a job in two years. Uh, everyone had moved to fo you know photography, so." I continued to do all of these these um, um, real art pieces. I just I picked my favorite movies and would pick a scene from them. And I didn't want to just do a copy of the of the still. So what I would do is I would bring out maybe you know the character from the still, but I'd find a background from someplace else, and I would add in other little bits and elements. And um, basically, working on them made me a better uh, made me better at what I did. So I was a much better storyboard artist. I was a much more better comic book artist, but I very rarely sold anything as a painting or as an illustration. Uh, I mean, I was doing, again, these were my fun. These are what I did for fun. I wasn't doing this to make a living doing it. So, um, you know, cause I, I was making a good living working as a, as a board artist or, you know, whatever else. All right. Well, the Lady Gaga is still available. Uh, looks like we should probably move on to lot number 22. And just so you know, most of the uh, remaining items that we have are Mike's paintings. Um, so it's really so sort of these real art paintings. So that's what we're going to be closing with. Uh, hopefully you'll like what you see, um, but we'll have a few of those different ones. 
but again, if you've got, uh, if you wanted some of say his black and white pit acts, the exotic is still available, go to my calf gallery and you can see what's still available as far as some of the previous things, but the rest will be paintings uh, that will be coming up here. So the next one is, uh, has a likeness of, of Ava Gardner on this one. So three, two, one. Mike, you want to talk about the lady and the tiger? Um, the tiger and all the stuff behind her are inconsequential. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, although nicely drawn, although nicely drawn. This is um, Ava Gardner was in a movie with Burt Lancaster called The Killers, and um, it was like uh, it was Ava Gardner and the dress, um, and uh, I I must have done a half a dozen paintings since then with Ava Gardner in that dress. And uh, I have like several different um, poses that she took during that photo session. Um, but um, it just, you know, um, again, this is the kind of thing that I would do is like, uh, you know, I brought this out and just, uh, like I said, I used her um, and added in uh, the foliage was probably from my neighborhood, the tiger, um, you know, reference from someplace or whatever. Um, but uh, um, just like, you know, that was, that was a fun thing to work on for the week. Okay. And the size Great on this, noise. yeah, the size on this, I believe is uh well, we got it 10, 10 by 15. Right. <laughs> And all these are done with acrylic on illustration board. All right. So I haven't had any, I haven't had any anybody reserve this yet, so it's still available, either this and the previous painting. And I know people are still wondering if some of the also the black and white, that might be some some people's favorites for some of the wash paintings. The exotic, which is lot sixteen, or sorry, lot fifteen, excuse mm -hmm. me. Uh, is still available at 600. So if you're looking for that, that's a nice, real large wash black and white piece as well. If you're more in that vein rather than the color pieces, but I think the colors are nice and, and you know very reasonably priced, Mike. You know I think the last two have been $350 for a full painting, which you really can't find anything in that range. You know I think that's as detailed as what you're selling here. So I think I think there's some great things, and I'll tell you one thing is. Uh, of your paintings, uh, my mother and father, I have a painting that Mike gifted me a, a years ago, and they actually stole it from me to put it up at their house because they just loved it so much that they wanted to th take it when they went to Indiana. So I have to go visit it now when I, it's in the bathroom I stay in in Indiana, but uh, they're big fans themselves. So I think that's the other thing about Mike's work is it's not only appealing, say, to comic fans, but also Potentially to your parents or in-laws, you know. So. so they left you your G.I. Joe artwork, but they took uh, Greta Gerwig. <laughs> I got the G.I. Joe artwork. They they uh, they like your painting. So good. Anyway, so um, let's uh, let's move on to the next one, which is lot twenty-three. I actually love this painting, and it's only three hundred uh, nine by fifteen. But uh, I love the energy in this. So three, two, one. Yeah, this is a Lori Lovecraft painting, Lori dancing for the coven. And again, um, I actually, uh, one of my favorite models, I think probably posed for, for this. She was a, a um, um, you know, a, a Middle Eastern dancer. Uh, so that's probably where the pose comes from. Um, the characters in the background, years and years ago, I found those great pictures of all these guys in cloaks. And I uh, thought, yep, they're they're perfect for the you know, for the audience. And the background is is some um, uh, Asian temple that I found. Um, that I thought, yeah, that'd be a good place to you know, to to do this. And in terms of doing a lot of these, it's almost like you're you're creating your own little uh, you know uh, movie set. And and Mike, this one has been claimed as well as somebody else claimed lot 22. So lots 22 and lot 23 are now both claimed. Okay. But go ahead. But so, you know, what I love about it is just the contrast between sort of the light foreground and then the background on that one as well. I just think it ends up again, sort of popping 
from a visual perspective on this. It's one of the things I got from Norman mm -hmm. Rothwell was, um, you know, he would do these things where he would put one part of the picture in very warm colors and with her with all the, you know, the warm flesh. And then another part of the, the you know, another ba you know, basic part of the picture in all cool colors. Uh, Drew Struzan does the same thing. It's not yeah, anything that's on my I think I've heard of uh, those guys before. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, that, for me, that was uh, especially only, you know, for a $300 painting, I think that's a, a fantastic buy, frankly. Uh, a great piece. And whether you give it to your parents or they take it from you, it's a, <laughs> it's a great piece. But let's, uh, let's move on to lot 24 here. And the dimensions on this are 13 and a half by 14. And uh, price on this will be 350. Three, two, one. All right. What was your inspiration on this one, Mike? Christina Applegate. <laughs> we all grew up on, on Married with Children. I was going to say, were you watching an episode of Married with Children and said, I got to draw Christina Applegate? Or well, what no. seemed, why, it, why did you come to mind? Kelly Bundy was always like the hottest teenager on TV. And um, I was probably way too old to be looking at teenagers. <laughs> I was going to say, Mike, uh, for, that you was know, my generation, you know. Um, but she always just fascinated me as just a, this really, you know, kind of, you know, as a character. Um, but then I found this this great, you know, I, you know, you're going through pictures of London in the 30s, and I found this this wonderful silhouette and these uh, maids that were working there, and it just. Again, it's just kind of like you know setting the juxtaposition of of uh, uh, you know the 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 um, Downton Abbey dinner table with um, um, Kelly Bundy as the main course and and um, you know London in the background. Um, so uh, uh, I'm sure I'll have a lot to answer for somewhere down the line, but it was fun to do. Yeah, yeah there's, there's actually a uh, Tales from the Crypt cover that has a very similar pose, if I remember correctly. Oh, right. That you did. With, with Demi Moore. Yes, that is correct. Yeah. So uh, that is, uh, that, that's what that brought to mind. But yeah, some, some a little bit more suggestive in the, as far as her pose. But I, I remember actually seeing, I think I saw two versions, Mike, because they actually changed the angle of the leg on the Demi Moore painting because they thought it was too suggestive for HBO, I believe. <laughs> so they had uh, you edit that one. Series? Uh, it wasn't too suggestive for HBO, believe me. When we shoot that series, they would shoot one scene for HBO, and then they would shoot it a second time with costumes and dialogue appropriate for syndication, because they realized huh. you know, this was going to uh, you know, uh, be on someplace else. Oh, smart. And they were asking me to do that with the covers. Um, so. <laughs> they they had you edit it. It was actually, I think it was just a, a paste up that they put over the leg to sort of change the angle of oh, it. Oh, you have to show yeah. me that. I don't think I was ever aware of it. So yeah, yeah. All right. Well, this one's still available for uh, three hundred and fifty dollars. This is lot twenty four. We also have the Lady Gaga painting at lot twenty one. The exotic mm -hmm. uh, wash pinup, uh, which is lot fifteen. And then there were some storyboards and the Sisterhood of Steel and Starfire. So go back in my calf and take a look at what other things are still available that you might be thinking about. But we're going to continue on with some of the paintings here. Uh, this is a, you know, a little different uh, taste, but I love this painting um, as well. So let's update that in, let's see, three, two, one. The man himself, James Bond, Sean Connery. Yeah. Mike, you want to comment on on your inspiration on this one? Sean Connery. I mean, it was, it was <laughs> um, like I said, I grew up, I love films. And I can remember being, I think I was a junior in high school. And I went one night to see this new movie that come out called um, Goldfinger. And I, I just, I, my jaw dropped. I'd never seen anything like, I mean, Sean Connery was so cool as this character uh, that the next night I actually went back, something I never did, I went back and saw the movie again, mostly because these guys were all talking English and I couldn't understand them. Um, and know, this I, is sold, Mike, just so you know. This what's one that? Is now sold. 
This one is now sold. Okay. Uh, and, and again, the background is actually um, from the Charlie Chaplin film that he done. In, he did in the 40s, I think, called Monsieur Voudot. Um, and um, the cat is uh, my former cat, Repo. So, I mean, I just, uh, again, you're bringing in these different, <laughs> different bits and pieces and juxtaposing them against each other. Um, the... Um, uh, the man in the background was actually a statue that was uh, in the um, uh, in the Chaplin film. Um, so I mean, it's it's um, um, and again, a lot of my inspiration for this was one of the things I loved about the illustrator Robert Fawcett was he always drew a lot of junk. Is is there was there were all these wonderful antique pieces all over the uh, you know the illustrations. Same thing with Bob McGinnis. Is like you'd have these just gorgeous women, but they'd also be sitting in the in the greatest looking chair you'd ever seen in your life, or with a little coffee table. And he uh, he said, "Well, you can thank my wife for that because she would always take me to these antique places and and uh, you know point out furniture or whatever." Joe, yes, it is Don Quixote. Thank you. All right. Well, that one sold. So uh, great piece, a little different than the, the, the typical pinups that you're used to, but I think very manly and a very great piece to display in your house. Um, but we're going to move on to lot 26, which is uh, one of my favorites being here in California. Um, but I will we'll go ahead and show it back to the sort of the pinup girl. Three, two, one. Oop, Bill, are you there? Can you hear me, Chuck? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Can you guys hear me? Uh, I can hear you. Can you hear us? I can I can hear you. Uh, yeah, okay. I think Bill. Can you hear? For whatever reason, I think we lost Bill. Maybe Bill got lost. Well, we'll we'll wait for Bill. Although I believe I've put the next piece up on the calf gallery, which is a girl in the bikini painting. Mike, you may want to show that, and I'll continue on with the show while we wait for Bill to get back. Maybe his battery died, unfortunately, on his thing. But uh, this is a 12 by 20 piece that we've got. Uh, and for me, you know, being here in Southern California really just summarized what it means to be in California. And I know this was one of the very first paintings you did. It's dated 1997 um, down below. But I guess uh, background on this one, Mike. Um, you know, again, again, Southern California, um, I, I think. I think I was telling you the other day, I think I probably used an old photo I had of Marilyn Monroe for the body of the, of the woman. Um, and as what happened in a lot of my pieces, the face actually looks an awful lot like my wife. Uh, <laughs> Which she also made an appearance in She-Hulk, I remember, in some other, other uh, Hell, uh, Hellraiser and some other places. You know, people yeah. always look at Lori Lovecraft, you know, we'll meet her at a convention and go, were you his model for that? You know. And, uh, uh, and she always says, oh, of course I was, you know, very graciously. Um, so, um, but yeah, it's sort of a great piece, but the, yeah, I think it's interesting uh, juxtaposition, juxtaposition of things that you were sort of seeing in your, uh, coming out to California and getting started on that, but also Marilyn Monroe and your wife. So and, and also, going on uh, here, right? Uh, the the big influence was uh, there's the uh, there's the uh, uh, illustrator from the early nineteen or twentieth century, a uh, Coles Phillips, and what he would do is he would drop out, he would you know the the background would blend right into the costume of the character sometimes, so that was the kind of thing I was trying to do with the with the bikini so that the you know the sun in the background actually formed her her bikini, so. Uh, um, Yeah, 
All right. Well, I guess we're still waiting to see if Bill, hopefully people out there can still see us, but we can't necessarily see your comments, I think, because I think Bill's running the running the show on those. Yeah. But we're going to continue forward as if you guys can hear us. Hopefully you can uh, without Bill here. But I'll go ahead and release these on CAF. And I guess Mike will also just show up the physical pieces while we do that. And I'll just go ahead. And again, you can email me. Uh, for those that didn't write it down before, at Comic Connection, C-O-M-I-C. Oh, wait, I think there's the host. I am. Hey, Bill. Man, my entire internet dropped. I, I'm so sorry. Come on, you ran out for lunch. No, no. I've been, we I've went been, too long. I guess that's a sign. No, I got to go. No, I'll, I, I'll see you. Everything went red. I, I, so I, I completely <laughs> apologize. I'm so sorry about that. That's never happened during a live stream for me before. <laughs> So sorry, sorry. My, my ear pods might give out in just a bit. I think they're starting to wind down as well. Uh, but uh, we just finished lot 26. We were talking about the girl in the bikini. Mike showed it live and we showed it on calf. Anybody that's interested in the girl bikini, right. that is uh, is still available. Uh, but we'll go ahead and move on to lot 27, if that's all right. Okay. Just to keep things rolling here. This is 11 and a quarter by 16. Uh, and I will go ahead and make it visible on calf in three, two, one. Mike, I know this is one of your personal favorites, inspired by Julie Newmar. Um, you know, I, I did two or three pictures of Julie Newmar as Catwoman, and I had them with me at a convention. and And one of my friend, and she was at the show. And one of my my artist friends said, "Oh, I, I've got to show that to her." And I was kind of tied at the table, and so yeah, I'll go, you know. And he takes it over, and he comes back and goes, "Oh, she says she really has to meet you." So I, I walked over and, and met Julie Newmar and got a picture and, and it was great because I grew up not only with her as Catwoman, but also um, she was in a TV series with Bob Cummings called My Living Doll. And, and this one has been claimed, just so folks know. This one has been claimed. And um, um, just, you know, it, it's, it's like as a teenager, um, it was just like, I have never seen anyone that gorgeous before, uh, and she was she was she was also she was a very sweet woman. So, um, and um, yeah, like I said, and again, the background. I think the background is probably some little bit from uh, Bob McGinnis from one of his covers of just you know some of that furniture I was talking about, mm -hmm. um, and uh, the cats are either various cats of mine or or. Uh, ones that just showed up. So uh, <laughs> uh, then I found reference pictures of, but uh, um, and I, I, she was also very happy with this. Um, um, you know, I showed her a copy of it. So. And Mike, do you want to show? I mean, I think what's interesting to see in person is the gold tint to that one compared to some other paintings. Uh, it's got sort of the background on it, sort of shines oh. compared to. Yeah, and you're not going to see it on on the screen so much. But you can see the reflection here is yeah. Uh, when you're working with acrylic, it's pretty much a flat surface. But there's metallic. But there's metallic. Right there's you know there's a metallic um, element to this paint, so you can get this that that very you know like like a glittery surface to it. What I thought was perfect for uh, you know for for kind of the Catwoman persona. All right, uh, well, right. that one has now been sold. We're gonna move on to lot 28. This is 13 by 18, uh, another painting that we've got coming up here and released in three, two, one. More cats, a couch, and an actress. Well, not an actress exactly, but you wanna talk about this one. This is another Lori piece. Um, right? It's another Lori piece, and I think this was probably this somebody like Alice Fay. I was just it was a great glamour photo I found in from the forties that I thought, oh, this has got to be you know great to do a picture of. Um, and the background, again, it's something that uh, um, uh, you know I found another photo and the working of it, uh, and, and like I said, it just served as really kind of a nice little simple. Um, um, what do you call that? Um, uh, archway to frame her with. Um, 
And um, again, the cats, I think one, one was from my niece. One was a longtime cat that we had. And the other one was one of her kittens at one time. So, um, and, and this has been claimed just so folks know. Okay. Congratulations to the buyer. Congratulations. Absolutely. This is a good, good pickup. Yeah. I like, again, hey, it's got that sort of for our models. Okay. That's why <laughs> he called her a pickup. <laughs> <laughs> that was tongue in cheek. I, I admit, <laughs> I think Mike, when I saw this, there was some, uh, I guess recollection of that first Marilyn Monroe pinup in Playboy, where she's you know sort of in the red dress, but yeah. obviously in the purple dress. I think I sort of evoked that when I saw this piece. I, I spend a lot of time, or, or I should say, part of my library is a lot of the glamour photography that came out of Hollywood in the '40s, like uh, Peter, like guys like uh, uh, Peter Hale and uh, uh, Bull, and and there's there's several of them, and there's all these wonderful photographs of, of uh, you know, all the actresses from the 30s and 40s uh, in these just stunning dresses and, and sets and costumes. And uh, they're always a big inspiration for my, my real artwork. All right. Well, I, let's, uh, oops, sorry, go ahead. Well, I, was, I saw Larry had mentioned in the chat that, you know, you didn't get the, a full close up on the, the uh, girl in the bikini artwork, oh. which was uh, the lot 26. So I wanted to Pull that up here for everyone. And again, sorry for my internet outage. I don't know what happened. And, and by the way, that that big line in the middle is simply is this was too big to scan. Mm -hmm. And so there's two scans put together, and it's always really difficult to try and get one to match up with the other. Um, so uh, so the yellow on the on the actual painting is much more uniform. All right. Well, there we have that one out there now. Good. Yeah, I think that's that's one of my personal favorites, but I guess I'm a little biased being here in California. So. <laughs> Reminds me of, of my of my home here. Yeah, we, just right. have, well, we, we only have smokestacks out here, so we you wouldn't get the same kind of <laughs> painting. So the spawn the one might be, you know, the spawn storyboards might be more for you. Exactly. Those dirty alleys are more reminiscent of my home. You got all the Lake Erie to keep you. Uh... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, we, we're down. To, we're down the last two. We're on lot twenty nine here. Uh, just before this goes up, this is thirteen by eighteen inches, and uh, price is going to be four fifty on this one. Three, two, one. Um, size is a little different. Oh wait, I missed that one. You you missed having the painting? No, no, no. I just I I I'd somehow put it in a pile already. I've got the painting here, but uh, okay. Yeah, um, you know. One of the things I was really blessed with out here was, uh, I, again, I would, I would go to a figure drawing class every week. We had the best models. And when you're looking for models, you're not just looking for someone with a pretty face. You're looking for someone who understands story in the same way that you do. So it, it's like all these models would come up with, with, with different costumes, uh, with different poses. They would present a different persona. Um, and it was always a treat when you got a model who really brought her own personality into, um, the, um, you know, to the picture. But one of the other things they started to do was they would have these, these parties where they would do, uh, you know, uh, uh, they call them the gallery girls, I think was one group, but, uh, you'd get like eight, 10 models and they would all show up and the, it would start at 10 o'clock and you would draw until two in the morning. I, if I made it till midnight, I was lucky. Um, and they would do these different themes. Like this one, I think, was something called Turkish Delights. And they would all come in, you know, in the different costumes. Um, and, um, uh, and this was a model I had never drawn before named Larva uh, was her, her name. And... Um, and I immediately came home and got all, all of my uh, Mad Mummy reference that I was using of different statues and things like that. And so enhance the surroundings. But uh, 
yeah, this is definitely a painting that that would belong in the in the Mad Mummy collection almost. Um, but it was um, um, yes, I used I used my own cartouche in that one for yeah. just paint it with. Um, you know, I, I just stuck that in the background. But as you say, I think, you know, people that like mummies and like sort of that Egyptian feel to it, this has got a little different than some of the other painting, yeah. paintings that you've done before. And I like how you put your vase name in the hieroglyphics over there. So, yeah, uh, way of disguising your signature. So, well, you know, I was going to say in, in, in and the uh, cats feel right at home, by the way. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I mean, you know, um, Bast is one of the great, uh, you know, the cat god of Egypt. And in the foreground, you've got, uh, you know the 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 one from the king of uh, King Tut, the uh, what do you call those? The jackals that guard the tomb. As as far as the signatures, um, all of the Egyptians signed their name that way. That was called a cartouche, and you know so you would see you know like like each one of them had their own little uh, signature box like that. All right. Well, that one's still available. Um, and as I said, we've got one more painting here coming up. We'll go ahead and release that, and then we'll, we'll do a, a full review of everything that's still available. Uh, if people want to review it or and, and get, claim something before the sale actually ends here, but um, this one's actually a little bit smaller. It's ten by twelve, but also if you want an example of Mike's uh, paintings and uh, you want something a little less expensive, this one's only two hundred and fifty dollars. So, in three, two, one. And Mike, I like the color and lighting on this. I mean, it's a nice dark setting here, but uh, you want to give a little bit of background on on uh, yeah, what inspired you? Did, did three or four uh, different. In fact, I was showing them to you. I did at least two or three paintings. Uh, this is the model who uh, who was the model for the Gypsy Twins, um, and she just had this wonderful dramatic sense of posing. She always bring these great costumes with her, and in this one, she had this this wonderful cloak. Um, and, um, so that's kind of where this one started with the, the cats, uh, there's a great book someone did called dancing cats. So I'm always using little, uh, you know, like, like they, they wind up in, in uh, the painting someplace. Um, and, um, um, the, the background are basically the, um, uh, what they call the magic stones that come from England. They're, uh, you know, the, the big um, uh, Stonehenge is certainly the most famous one, but there's all kinds of little, you know, druid towers that remain across the countryside that, uh, um, and I just, I, I added in my own, uh, um, uh, I'm trying to, what do you call those? They're, they're, they're different signs of, uh, uh, of, um, um, each one has a different meaning, none of which I know because I'm not well versed enough in that. But they're um, they're all from uh, um, different symbols. I tried to get as much kind of that sense of magic as I could into this runes. Yeah. Yes, runes. Well, I wanted to say lot twenty nine has sold, which was the previous lot in the Egyptian tombs, but this one is still available. Lot thirty. So if somebody wants to claim this one, it's still available. Uh, otherwise, you should Bill. Should I recap the ones that are still available here? Sure, that sounds like a good idea. We can go, yeah, vote. Let's go ahead and do that. So, go starting at the beginning, the and again, anybody uh, can see these on my comic art fan site, Charles Costas. Um, it, there's a Starfire number six page, number 13, which is $400, and this is about 10 by 15. Uh, we talked about sort of Mike doing some of his own inking on this, even though it's Coletta inks, and then sort of the homage to. Uh, the villain in Brave and the Bold 36 down there. Um, next is Sisterhood of Steel, number eight, pages 26 and 27. So this is a large double page spread. Uh, all one board and actually a little bit bigger than uh, than uh, what we had. And actually, uh, oops, I had a question. Who inked this page? Mike, On sorry, on the Starfire page, can you go back and just talk about where you inked and where Vinny, Vinny, um, Vinny inked this? Everything on the page is inked by Vinny, except in the bottom three frames, those shadowy figures, all the smoke and the shadows I did. Great. 
So if that, hopefully the person asked that question, if they've, if that helped, um, that, you know, this one is still available. So feel free to go ahead and claim that one. But the Sisterhood of Steel, uh, again, sort of a, it's sort of the ending of the storyline here, large double page spread all on one big board and bleeds all the way to the, and that making it bigger than uh, double, sort of normal double sized spread would be. So another great piece if you're a fan of the Sisterhood. And then we've got two storyboard lots, starting with lot number nine, which is uh, Mike's work on HBO Spawn, for which he won an Emmy Award. And uh, again, we picked out sort of four really you know, nice single pieces. And then there is a set of uh, seven pages of Mike's uh, rough thumbnails that, that show you how he sort of laid out his, uh, his storyboards for these. Um, and very hard to find that, that Spawn stuff. So there's 11 storyboards that come in this. The, the first two are eight and a half by 14. The others are eight and a half by 11. And then um, moving on to lot 10, that is the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe storyboards. And it's only presented with a few different uh, panels here, but you get a full set of 29 and each page pretty much has two on it. So you really get a, a you know over 50 drawings of Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe from a very famous scene where Aslan goes off to essentially die. Uh, and that was probably one of the most memorable sequences both in the book and in the movie. That lot of 29 pages is only $800. So again, you know, you can keep that whole or you could break it up depending on what your, uh, what your desires are. But great to sort of see Mike's full set of storyboards that are, have tones on them as well as, uh, as his inks. And then um, lot 15, which I know the large uh, pinups, the black and white ones and the wash ones were very uh, appealing to most people. And we sold out of all of those except for this one, which is the exotic pinup. This is larger than normal, 13 and a quarter by 20, and uh, only $600 for this. And then finally, we've got a, uh, starting with the paintings, the full paintings, Lot 21, which is uh, inspired by Lady Gaga, and a great background that Mike had, had found there. But uh, uh, I like, I actually love the detail on her boots, Mike, the fact that you've got those studded boots in there. That's, that's my favorite detail of the whole painting, believe it or not. But uh, a lot of great elements that are to this. And if you're a Lady Gaga fan, even though Mike can't name uh, two of her songs, I would say uh, Paparazzi and Bad Romance are two that I can pick out. But, uh, but uh, somebody out there that also can pick out more than that, this is the painting for you. I always and, tell people, uh, what? I, say, I always tell people I like music of the 70s, the 1770s. <laughs> Well, she's she's still she's got something coming up in uh, a new movie about Gucci coming up soon. But uh, uh, let's, moving on to lot twenty four, if you're more of a, a Kelly uh, a Kelly Bundy, aka Christina Applegate person, this is a painting for you. Uh, a little juxtaposition of uh, her on a dinner table with the sort of old London setting. So uh, an interesting composition to this one. This is four fifty. Oh, excuse me. This is three hundred and fifty. And it's 13 and a half by 14 inches. And then uh, two more. We have uh, the my personal favorite, Lot 26, which is the uh, girl in the bikini, inspired a little bit by Marilyn Monroe, a little bit by Mike's wife, uh, but also living in Southern California here. One of the first real art paintings Mike had done. And this one is uh, 12 inches by 20 inches. And when you see this live, I think the thing I notice about it is, is the, the yellow and green sort of really pop. So it, it's harder to see it sort of on the screen here. But when you see the actual painting, it's, it's a really uh, impressive piece in person. It's a great composition. And, yeah, it's a great composition as well. So a good way to start out your career on that. And uh, although not, not uh, the, the, uh, the back alleys that, uh, that Bill would be <laughs> to, great for uh, anybody that either dreams of being in Southern California, maybe you miss San Diego Comic-Con, <laughs> this will remind you of. Uh, and then finally, we have the Dancing Cat painting, which is $250. It's a 10 by 12 painting. Um, and uh, yeah, you've got the, the, the sort of mystic elements that Mike is known for with a lot of stuff he does with Lady with uh, Lori Lovecraft. Also got the cats uh, and one of his favorite models that he uses there. So again, only, only $250. So if, uh, if any of those appeal to you, those are the ones that are still left. You know, it's been... Uh, a, a great show today. Uh, we've really appreciated, uh, you know, frankly, the, the, the rabid response in many cases for some of these pieces that you guys got. 
And uh, I'll get back to everybody after this with a total. I'm going to take a little bit of a break this afternoon. I'll get back to you hopefully later this evening. Uh, and we'll sum up every, you know, if you won more than one piece. Uh, shipping, again, is $50, uh, no matter how many pieces for those folks that are in the U.S. For those that are outside, Mike will work with you on the uh, the total shipping for that. Uh, but, Mike, final words from yourself today? Um, just, I'm, 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 I'm very flattered that you even asked me to be here today. The idea that all this artwork sold, I'm, I'm like, mm, I'm going to be tough to live with. Um, for, for those of you who might've been interested in the piece and, and it, you didn't, you missed it for whatever reason, again, you might want to check out James Mealy's sequential treasures because he has some of the mad mummy pieces and, uh, maybe a few lorry pieces and things like that. And, this has been, like I said, such a, 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 a so flattering for me. Uh, I'll make Chuck come by and select a whole nother stack of drawings and put them up sometime now. That was a lot of fun, Mike. It really was. All right. Well, Still, I think we, we could have we could have yeah. talked a lot more about your career too early on. So uh, we should have just had you on for an interview too. It would have been fun. Um, this was great. Yeah, and I think lots 26 and lots 30. Somebody is just asking about those. I'll get back, but they may have also sold. So thank you uh, to the person inquiring about those. All right. Well, this has been, uh, again, a lot of fun. And obviously, we hope to do more of these in the future, Mike. So you would always be welcome back on, uh, on one of these uh, interview slash sale shows here on the Comic Art Live channel. I really, really appreciate you taking the time because you had to start out in the morning over there. So this is a... Uh, you know, this was just a lot of fun. I love doing these. I'll try and be more obnoxious next time. <laughs> I don't see how Bill, you could. thanks again. You're, you're a great host. And thanks for, you know, for allowing us to uh, to appear on the forum here. I think it's it's a great way of showcasing the art and, you know, giving people the behind the scenes stories on the creation of these things, which you don't necessarily get to, to do if you're just buying it from a dealer at a show. Um, so I'm glad we had the opportunity to bring Mike out and get him out of his dungeon there and uh, and get him in front of fans. My dungeon. Uh, <laughs> what? Well, it's my dungeon over here. <laughs> but uh, great, great opportunity. So, Bill, thanks, thanks so much, and thanks to all those people that, that took all the time. Sorry we took so long. I am a long-winded individual uh, as well, and uh, just good to be here and and great day. So, thanks all. Thank yes, you. Thank you. Thank you.